Ooh, ooh, yuggera, yuggera. Ah! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cohen Brothers Brothers. Hey, uh, as Abe so wholeheartedly demonstrated, uh, today we're discussing what the fifth, the fifth movie in the Cohen. The fourth movie. Wait, yes, now the fifth. Barton was fourth. Yeah, you're right. Um, the fifth movie. A Hudsucker Proxy. <laughs> Go Eagles! That's what I was waiting for. Um, what year was this? 94 was yeah. The Hudsucker Proxy. Yeah. And uh, it's it's been one of my favorite movies for a long time since I was a little kid. I didn't know until we started researching for this that it failed hard. Yeah. Yeah, both we- critically and financially. But it might be... All right, so... Just because you're, it's one of your favorites. Mm-hmm. It's also one of my favorites, which always makes for a great podcast. But too. that's well, that's Guys what I wonder. Are we wrong? All, most of the critics thought it <sighs> well, was bad. I think there's a difference of in when we look at the Coen Brothers canons. We're going to talk about a few different things, like just fun. This what this gets the crown to me is density. It is so dense with jokes, so dense with like. It seems it's very small and humble because it was written in like 84, 81. Yeah. Like they took a, they took like a 10 year waiting to make this movie. And are you going to say why? Uh, if you want it's me to. It's a delightful story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's everyone's they, favorite story about They this, sent uh, Paul Newman a script with, they're like, you need to be Sid. Sidney J. Musburger. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and uh, he was just like, I love this script. I don't think I'm a comedic actor. I'm so no. I don't think I, I can do this. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you'll be perfect. And the, he's like, ah. And then after their success and the fact that they, you know, had come up with some, you know, I think probably Miller's Crossing did it for him. Sure. There's some, sure, sure. Albert Finney's role was a role he could have played yeah. easily and did later in Rose. I think he realized they're for real. Yeah. And it wasn't just script writers, but they were good directors. And he finally, like, buckled in and uh yeah if i recall you was like yeah whatever happened with that script and they said well we're waiting for you to say yes we imagine won't make it i'm sure there's edits in those 10 years but yeah. imagine you're sitting on this script for 10 years that's we've insane had, i like to think that the scripts that we've had that we've sat on for 10 years will get made eventually oh yeah in which case we'll have to say that's what I always thought was interesting is so many people would you'd see them say like, yeah, this movie took eight years to make. And writing a screenplay doesn't really take it should take less than a year, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I realized is when people say that they mean a bunch of that time was dead time. They mean they were sitting on, on other things. For a long time. They just yeah. really wanted to make it getting the project together. They didn't like. Yeah, yeah, they didn't like say like, yeah, I, yeah. Blood Simple sounds good, but like Hudsucker Proxy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Although I wanted to bring up what you said about density, because one of the things that most interests me about the movie is I realized because we, so when we covered Raising Arizona, we quoted such a high percentage of the film, word for this word. This one too. I really? Think. So I found myself writing way fewer verbal quotes and way more describing visually what's happening. I think it's dense, but it's dense on the visual level, whereas Raising Arizona, not that it slouches visually, but it's dense on the scripted level. Sort of like um, Lebowski, which we won't dip into too much because I'm sure people are waiting for it. Or Oh Brother. Is dense on the scripted level. Oh Brother kind of has both cylinders firing. But this one is, and maybe I just am nuts for Frank Capra because it's obviously an ode Mm, to that era of classic Hollywood filmmaking. Yeah, and you should explain more Frank Capra's influence because you'll have better things to say. But it's how do you do that? <laughs> the uh, the visuals of it, there's like five of the best montages in all of the totality of oh, film are in the Hudsucker Proxy in yeah. terms of how the visuals move and work and are so engaging. I think there's. It's interesting to me that I thought you were. I thought you would have been a lot more captivated by the language of this because it's so. Archaic. It really shows off what I think the superpower of the Coen brothers are, Mm -hmm. which is like archaic speech. And the fact that it's like, especially uh, Amy Archer, played by uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, Mm. uh, she's just, she's doing her best Catherine Hepburn impression and she's firing on all cylinders in regards to her speed of delivery and just constantly talking, you know, and just like, 
a few of the quotes. I couldn't even write it down. Right. I wrote down a few, but I couldn't write it down because it was just so much. Although someone did point out online that one of the few mistakes she makes is when she's answering all the crossword puzzle answers really fast while she's also typing an article yeah. and doing a monologue and smoking a cigarette. Mm-hmm. The guy asks for a six-letter word for a disease of the... Goiter. Hypothalamus, and she says goiter, but goiter is actually related to the something else. Oh, okay. <laughs> like your gallbladder. All right. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Neil deGrasse Tyson, that's the she stars thinks. in Titanic. Yeah. No, it's fine. She's not as great as she thinks. That's good. All- I don't think that they went that far, but that's kind of hilarious no, if I, they make her out. Because she is wrong in this movie several times and then ends up being right. So she changes. She's the first to change, which is a wonderful thing about this movie. All right. So that brings us to the first of three spectra through which we always view the beautiful rainbowy prism that is the Cohen's work. Uh, the three spectra are diegesis, pedagogy, and how do you do that? Let's talk diegesis because we started mentioning basically... Uh, The nuts and bolts of the film, the central question of at least the A plot is asked by our faux narrator Moses right at the top, is Norville really going to jelly up the sidewalk? (laughs) That's basically the central question we're faced with. Mm -hmm. And then we flash back. So we see that Norville Barnes is contemplating suicide by jumping off the Hudsucker building. And it's New Year's Eve. And we flash back and see how this is all going to come together. Now, let's do a little chunk on Capra and other influences, because I think sure. that colors the whole thing. Like, what kind of movies did you this remind you of? And for people who don't know who Frank Capra is, I mean, we're talking It's a Wonderful Life as Capra, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of influences here, but uh, the look and the feel really specifically comes from like German and Russian expressionalism. And by that, I mean like the propagandist. It's also like kind of modern as in it's like it shapes like there's no, I don't want to get too much into it, but like everything's in little boxes uh, Mm -hmm. and everything has its perfect box. Everything is supposed to be ordered. And that was kind of uh, the Russians and the Germans post like world war two trying to, bring back their countries from a terrible like war that left the cool, the, their countries absolutely decimated had to rebuild. And so they got to decide what do these things look like? How do we build Mm -hmm. from here? And they both kind of went with this futurist kind of like ordered, ordered, pointed, structured kind of Picasso in an S in a way, you know, like like, this period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's more surrealist than them and, but they, all their propaganda was very sharp edges and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's the look and feel of the Hudsucker uh, industries building. I definitely see that cabinet of Caligari and stuff Uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Also the fact that he worked in a mail room and everything goes in these nice ordered boxes. Everything's on a grid. Clop it, clop it, Max Clop it, Jr. And then the (laughs) other thing is that uh, how much time and attention Hudsucker pays to the little minutia of things. Uh, like when they're testing out the hula hoop, it's mm. like all it's like everything's like now we got to test it by throwing a bomb at it and stuff like that. So it's just the it's just steady operation using the art forms that were already used to like kind of make fun and lampoon the societies that were growing in the 60s. And grand, remember, this takes place in 1958, yeah, yeah. And uh, so this is kind of but he's doing it in an American ni- mindset. I also will. I'll wait to pull it out later. Please do. God, please uh, do. But in terms of, there's also some French New Wave involved in there. Oh. So all this is la la. all this is just like a European brewery, and then taking place in an American landscape. Because that's why I keep bringing up Capra. Is the plot is pure classic Hollywood. Yes. Um, were those films of the classic Hollywood era, and I do mean things like I keep going to. Jimmy Stewart, but like Harvey and oh, It's a Wonderful Life, Cary Grant, Arsenic and Old Lace, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Classic Hollywood. Am I imagining that? It seems like a love letter to those, but those weren't, those didn't look like German expressionist influence. Well, it's did because they? they dip into it. So there's like that sequence when Amy and Norville first kiss. Like, it's like mm-hmm. a Harrell painting, who is the guy who did all the paintings of Cary Grant and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he did portraiture photography as well. Uh, or that's what he's most known for in that era, like the Warner Brothers area. And uh, like the fact that it fades out on them so they, they become, become silhouettes, silhouettes yeah. is kind of 
amazing in its own way because it's both stark and expressionalist in the way that European expressionalism was during like the late fifties. But it also was, it's also kind of a nod to what was going on in America during the time where there's this romance about how everything's, everything's beautiful and picturesque and uh, you know, all of our movie stars are picture perfect versions, you know, like it's kind of, both so there's scene what i'm saying is there's scenes that are both and then there's scenes where it's just like the ga- the uh, stamp gavels slamming home right which is like a very russian propagandist thing where it's like saluting as like you know planes are or flying over marching legs going but it's by, also yeah. capra because capra was one of the guys who in america revolu- like revolutionized the montage to have like words coming at them while they're okay. running. I was going to say, like did he invent that? I don't think he invented it. Who invented? I want to know. You probably don't know off the top I don't of your know. head, but I want to know. But and Capper it used up. it a lot. Simpsons uses it so much. Uh, the thing where transparencies of people's heads are hovering around your head yeah. and you're walking through a black void and, and they say quotes from earlier in the movie. And it happens at the yeah. beginning of the movie too, where it says like, experience necessary and he has no experience and yeah. it's just word montage over his face as they like they they move into the background but they like they just move past him right like it's just like he's immersed in this montage of words and then later he's immersed in this montage of hula hoops and montage of you know like dark yeah. night of the soul and right, which is of, a great segue to yeah. his first day and by he we mean norval barnes fresh from muncie indiana business college uh, uh, yeah, fresh off the bus in New York City, basically just trying to make his fortune. Very much that classic story of the male white protagonist as an everyman, which is ironic to say, but you know what I mean. In the classic Hollywood fashion where like how to succeed in business without really trying or whatever, yeah. it's like, he's going to try and make it. Yeah. He's in the big city. He's got that gumption. He's naive though. Oh, the city's going to eat him alive. Yeah. So he, what do they say? He's got whiskers on him. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Norville, hopes to make it with all of his business acumen from Muncie, Indiana. At the same time that he's at the beginning of his journey, Charles Durning, who plays Wearing Hudsucker, is at the end of his life's journey, which is he, has, he owns this giant company which, where Norville is trying to get a job. And even though they're experiencing tremendous success all the time, he's empty inside and depressed. Mm-hmm. That's like... More than any other Cohen movie, and a lot of Cohen movies are fable like, this one is the simplest in structure. And I think it is yes. intentionally so as an ode to those Hollywood movies where it's just like, his fortune goes up, then it goes down. Oh, yeah. he's got a big head, but he learned his lesson. Like, yeah. it really is like that. It's King Lear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, wearing Hudsucker gets up on the uh, desk, boardroom desk in yeah. front of the board, stockholders. Jumps out the window and kills himself, which I didn't know, uh, which kind of makes it even more grim. That's based on a specific true story. Did you know that? What? The wearing Hudsucker thing. Oh, yeah. Where they got the initial ideas. Uh, In 1975, Eli Black, CEO of the United Fruit Company, smashed an office window with his briefcase during the board meeting. I mean, you hear, like, it's a well-torn trope, the whole Wall Street broker jumping off the building. But that we covered in Cracks once is a misconception because Looney Tunes started using that image all the time. Right. And now we looking back think that must've happened then a lot. Mm -hmm. There's only two cases of someone jumping out of a building during the stock market crash. And it's even arguable whether that's the reason they jumped. They could have just jumped because of personal reasons. Right. But we get all the way where it's like, I think it's a haunting image at the very least. In Futurama, I think someone spends time as a worker who talks people into jumping. Just like a whole line of ruined businessmen. Um, but anyway, wearing Hudsucker, hits the pavement. Uh, Sid Musburger, who's his first in command, a.k.a. what's his name? Paul Newman. Newman's yeah. own. I just want to say Newman. Newman's own. own. <laughs> Newman's own body and soul and face yeah. starts to act in the movie. And Sid is immediately, because this is so operatic and play-like, you know he's the bad guy, right? He acts like the bad guy. Sure, sure. He smokes wearing Hudsucker's cigar, mm-hmm. like unfinished cigar, which if you recall in Miller's Crossing, Albert Finney's great Tommy Gun sequence has some good cigar play. Sid has such good cigar work in this 
First of all, you immediately know he's evil because he smokes a dead man's cigar right away. Right away, yeah. And then did you, I never noticed this except for this watch through, jumping way ahead. When Sid, spoiler alert, all the evil people get fucked over and all the good people with pure hearts do well. Yeah, you get, um, they get what they deserve. Sid is hauled off to the nut house. You can see that he is smoking a cigar, even though he's in a straight jacket being carried by two. I fucking love yeah. Sunnyvale Rest Home. Sunnyvale Rest Home. Yeah. Dr. Burden Furfin yeah. <laughs> yeah, sends him to. Um, so basically the whole plot just hinges on this very simple idea, which is they uh, now that Sid is dead, all the stock becomes public and the board is panicking because the company's doing so well that they can't afford to con- buy a controlling interest. This is going to go as an IPO, so any schmo, any jerk can buy <laughs> Any jerk stock. in a smelly t-shirt. <laughs> a smelly t-shirt can uh, <laughs> just buy their stocks. So they want to they wanna tank it intentionally over the next year so it's real cheap, and then they can buy back the shares and get the company going again. Kind of so like that the, the producers, actually. Yeah, it's actually, um, ba- uh, it's not based on, but there's a, there's, the Robert Downey Sr. film, Putney Swope, is based on the oh, okay. same kind of trope. You guys should watch that. It's like a postmodernist black exploitation film mm. where they're just like, they have the same thing, but then they say there's this guy, Putney Swope, who's like the janitor and he's yeah. also a black guy and it's a bunch of white people. And they're like, let's just give him the uh, company and then it'll tank kind of thing. And of course, he's just like, you're all fired is my first order of business. <laughs> and then he does a good job. Yeah. And then he yeah. does a great job and he like becomes a huge brand and hires all of his friends and they have parties. It's great. Well, if you want to see a post, post, postmodern surrealist take on the same thing, <laughs> sorry to bother you in theaters now. Uh, also right, excellent. Right, right. Um, so, and yes, as we referenced before, uh, Norville's in the building at the same time because he couldn't get a job. There's this great sequence with a job board. Uh, let's dig into that a little bit. That's the first time that we have text overlaid. Right. As he's like, like, I counted the montage. And they're like, clack, 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 like the stock market, which is a good way early in the film to not to get too much into pedagogy. But you're at this point, just so you know what's happening with our main character, he feels like a cog in the system already because they're just like, none of the jobs fit for him because they all have this catch 22, which is uh, looking for people who have had at least five years experience a great way to learn experience, you know, like that's right. the two. And he's like, well, I don't have that. I'm fresh. And off we get the boat. closer and closer on his face and words and then, start flying and then at he, him. He despairs. Must he goes to yeah. a coffee bar, has some coffee. Uh, he, as he exits though, he takes his coffee mug off or the waiter or the bartender does. And it highlights, uh, Hudsucker uh, Industries. So the coffee ring, the stain that his coffee cup left behind yeah. circles the ad. And then by yeah. some weirdness of fate, as he opens the door, the wind c- kicks in and kicks the single piece of paper that he needs in order for the entire story to happen. Hits him in the leg. He sees the Hudsucker opportunity. Goes to Hudsucker Properties. And just... Or Hudsucker Industries. As he walks through the door, essentially, Charles Durning is getting ready to commit suicide. Because Tim Robbins gets hired immediately, and during orientation, they pause for a moment of silence. Yeah. Um, Today, wearing Hudsucker, CEO of Hudsucker Industries, merged with the infinite. (laughs) Merged with the infinite. Which is my favorite term for dying. What's the the, the time... This time has been taken out of your... They have a moment of silence, and it goes, yeah, this has been duly noted on your time cards and will be drawn from your pay. I also (laughs) want to just point out uh, Coen Brothers' typical, like, flair for language. uh, Yeah, Norval's getting oriented with a classic sequence with a guy who's just constantly yelling at him. I just think it's amazing choreography because it's a one or pullback shot. Mm -hmm. First of all, how the fuck did they get the newspaper shot, Abe? Fans and a lot of takes. And just doing it over and over and over. How do you think they do YouTube trick shots if they don't have visual effects? There's several shots in this that seem like they must have taken an infinite number of takes. They did the Miller's Crossing hat and they figured out and learned things. There's also people who are just good with fans. You get a special effects department who are like good at controlling like a sequence of fans to make things move. 
But you know the Breaking Bad shot where he throws the pizza on the roof? That was, that first, was take. first take. And it was an accident. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, but back to this universe. Punch in late and they dock you. Yeah. Any article without a voucher and they dock you. Wrong color voucher and they dock you. Code it wrong and they dock you. File faulty complaint and they dock you. Which is my favorite one because it's like, have you? did you understand everything I said? Which is just a blitzkrieg of numbers and words and all these things. So well, that's of course the, you won't remember. It's not just the things you'll be docked at. The layering, I think, deserves credit. He's also pushing a cart and people in between every line hand him or take from him packages and give him clipped instructions like, this goes to J-6, while the guy's going like, anything with a J or an odd number is this color voucher. And all the colors are the same. One of my favorite bits in it is it's like, 33-I is a maroon voucher. 3-3-I is a burgundy voucher. Like, they're all the same, essentially. And then he goes, this has been your orientation. Is there anything you do not understand? Is there anything you understand only partially? If you have a complaint, you may file it. If you file a faulty complaint, they dock you. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets there and he meets a guy who's exceptionally good at throwing uh, mail letters into, into slots. slots. And he's getting to work. He's not phased yet. He's you know doing his thing. Even though every single person, it's like he's already in his catch twenty two, but. He seems not to be phased. He's no. He still thinks he's going to succeed. Yeah, in fact, in he fa- shows the old timer. You know, the for blueprint. Kids. The blueprint of his big idea. The hula- we don't know which what will it turn is out yet. to be the yeah. hula hoop. But of course, one of the greatest jokes in the movie that they bank off of several times is his blueprint for the idea is just a circle on a piece of paper. Yet he's like, oh shit, it's upside down and flips it over and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, And he's like, don't steal this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's amazing because he essentially, uh, he, that this is, I mean, I don't want to, I, I just want to talk about it now, even though it's slightly pedagogy, but there's more things. So I'll talk about it later as well. Sure. Um, there's no better like image in this film that represents Hudsucker Proxy than uh, Max Jr.'s having a very small cubbyhole, and he has a very big envelope that says "Do not fold." Yeah, w- but this is what propels us. It's Kafka-esque if it wasn't depressing. It's Brazil if yes. it was like f- lighter. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so he's trying to deliver to Max Clapp. He's like, Max I'll Clapp just Clapp take Jr. it there. Yeah. I like that the old timer, he goes, what do you do when the thing doesn't fit in the hole? And the old timer goes, well, if you fold it, they dock you. I usually throw them out. Yeah. <laughs> also, before we move on, just some choice lines from Sydney talking about wearing Hudsucker. Every step he took was a step up, excepting, of course, this last one. And uh, I, I just want to point out, because this is also the mezzanine sequence, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we can't get all the boardrooms. Things 44 out. floors, 45, counting the mezzanine. Yeah. He just dropped 45 floors, 44, not counting the mezzanine, which is hilarious because it's they reverse the people. So like right. sometimes one guy is very adamant that they say 45, and another time uh, he's all about 44. Yeah, that's them debating how many floors the guy committed suicide. But the from. mezzanine guy is always the same one. Yeah. We depress the stock to the point we can buy it at... 50 percent 51 not okay. counting the mezzanine which is just That's a nonsense term, yeah. joke so it's three it's two jokes uh, it's a flip and a non sequitur. the boardroom is repeatedly a greek chorus basically yeah because they also do uh how oh. long do we have before the stock goes public four weeks 30 days a month at the most yeah <laughs> it's like we get it nothing <laughs> you, executives say matters right they just try to piggyback but they, each other. they do cons- there's one or two times that they speak all in unison and i think it's only all hail the hud <laughs> yeah yeah long live the hud. long live the hud. long live the hud. <laughs> like so they're just pod people as well so say we all yeah. yeah um all right so as you could have guessed and you probably saw the movie we need a president who will inspire panic in the stockholder, a patsy, a proxy, a pawn. At that exact moment, through sheer fate, a blue letter is blue delivered. Letter. Blue letter! And they do the Wild West trope where everyone panics and hides except Norval because he doesn't know enough to know that a blue letter is something to be frightened of. It's usually news to the top brass. It's usually bad news, and you usually get fired. So Norval heads all the way up to the top floor, and as is very common in Coen Brothers movies... The elevator ride is eventful enough that we should discuss it. Uh, they like elevator scenes. Yeah. So this is where we meet Buzz, Jim Truefrost, in an amazing and it, performance. Yeah, who's some people who have seen The Wire will know him as uh, 
Pres- Presbluski. Presbluski. Yeah. yeah. The fuck up. The eternal fuck up. I love consider. I love imagining that Buzz's arc in this ends with him demoralized and moving to Baltimore and joining the force. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I also love his entrance line because he just he whips out of the elevator. Moves his uh, hat up so you can see his hair and then points back at the elevator while he says these three lines. Hey, yeah, buddy, my name's Buzz. I got the fuzz. I make the elevator do what she does. Yeah. And then right later in the same scene as people are coming in, Mr. Klein, 39, Mrs. Dell, personnel, Mr. Levin, 37, 36. Walk down. <laughs> Walk down. That's so revealing yeah. about the character. He needs, he needs <laughs> it to rhyme. Everything's on his time. Yeah. So... Then he realizes last second, just like everyone has, oh shit, this guy from the mailroom is supposed to be delivering a blue letter. He hits the Looney Tunes lever <laughs> and they go express they go warp to the top speed, floor. Yeah. And everyone, he goes, he does the classic, good luck, buddy. You're gonna need it. He's basically <laughs> Bugs <laughs> Bunny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Buzz is Bugs Bunny, um, but like better performed. No, Mel Blanc's great. Yeah, Mel anyway, Blank. not the point. Now we're introduced to... What I'm pretty sure is supposed to be the antithesis of Moses. Do you get that impression? Yeah. I feel problematic saying that because they did the one guy's black and one guy's white thing. Uh. But there's this guy who never speaks, whereas Moses only speaks directly to the audience. And kind and of doesn't interact with the characters. And this guy who never speaks is like, if, if Moses is the extension of wearing Hudsucker's will, which he will be throughout... This guy is an extension of Sid Musburger's malevolent will. Yeah, the you character's know name is Aloysius. Well, there. Uh, the names are so dumb. There's a letter that they hand him during the docu scene where he goes, "Hey, kid, don't forget, this is for Murgatross." I'm like, "Who the fuck is Mur- Murgatross?" I don't think you're supposed to know. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the thing: is that something I caught on this rewatch? Because I just like you was just like he just is an evil guy. I mean, look at his face. He looks like a Freddy Cougar. <laughs> looks like a skeleton man. Yeah. yeah so th- I guess they're just. He's just the evil janitor. Dipping into that, you know, but uh, I actually caught, like, I think there's actually a joke here, which is that he only hates Norville because later in, when he's, because in this scene, he's picking off the Warring Hudsucker. When he's, he's replacing He's scraping it. the name Warring Hudsucker off the office when door. He, he doesn't, he doesn't hate Norville in the scene. He's just like, where do I go to Sid? Sid's office. And, and he, he points, just points yeah. back. Later, though, I think he's actually a bad guy because he smudges his work when he brings in Jennifer Jason Lee later in the film. There's a shot where... Because he gets angry. He he's carries like, her mm. over the threshold, and they did a bit where he smudged the door, and that pisses off the janitor. I think that's it. I think you're stretching. I think... Well, it's, he has the one emotion that he actually shows in the but entire you're saying, film. So you're saying, he would still be crazy, though. Yes. Because that would mean that because someone smudged his door... He stands there and watches them dangle from the building and shuts the window and is like, I do want you to die. What is... You smudged my door. <laughs> That's... I mean, there's no reason for anything in this movie. Everyone is a cartoon. Well, that's... Yeah, that's pedagogy. That's the big thrust yeah. of pedagogy. But so, anyway, I would just wanted to... I think there's a reason why I hate him. It's filmed brilliantly in the way where everything's moving so fast and there's so much cool shit coming at you. You completely immediately forget the blue letter exists. We've mentioned it so many times that you won't forget, but that's the plan payoff for the end of the plot. Yeah, he puts it in his pocket. We, the on. audience, and I think it really works. We really do. You forget the blue letter exists right. because it really just seemed like an excuse to get him up there because mm-hmm. once he's up there, he has an amazing comical slapstick bit in Sid's office where... <laughs> he does a pitch. He pitches the hula hoop, which makes Sid yeah, realize... Kids. That he's the patsy they're looking for. He's so dumb. He's the perfect schmo to run the company. He's an imbecile. Yeah. but And I like that he almost doesn't get it. Do your friends call you jerk? He's too proud. Yeah. He almost doesn't get the job because he, yeah, your friends, they called you loser, jerk. No, actually, I was voted most likely to succeed. Get out of here. You're fine. You're fine. But then, because he accidentally lights the trash can on fire and destroys the Bumstead account, which is. Which is just Harold Lloyd written all over it. But it's also Casper from Miller's Crossing is Mr. Bumstead. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's so true. because he basically ruins Sid's office and wrecks an important contract, he's like, you're exactly the idiot we need. <laughs> and they decide to make him president and proceed with the hula hoop idea, right? There's some stuff in between. Uh, he does, the hula hoop's not involved. They just know that he's an idiot enough that yeah. he will tank. the. So they don't. Oh, yeah. We, the hula hoop doesn't come into play until active. Right. But. 
a beat that we should mention because I think it's maybe the. I have a theory that I hate to lay out in this podcast, but I do think, much like I love NPR, but I would say this about NPR content, when the Coens try to be edgy, funny, they come off kind of lame. And I think that we'll ha- I'll have to discuss that more in some future things. But when they come, when they try to do Looney Tunes humor or Pixar humor, universal humor, they're so good at it because the intentions are so clear and the co- yeah. they're so good at mastering they're cause and effect. This happened, so this happened. And Pixar does that too, where you're like, anyone in the world would laugh at this. It's funny because this happened and the thing fell over there and that makes sense. Um, I think the lamest bit in Hudsucker has got to be the double stitch pants because they go so far for the joke. I love you it. You like it. I then love it. Then you should describe it, because this show is about how much we love them. And I well, want to I want to say two things before we talk about the double stitch. One, okay. it's I love two things. I love that he stops time because he's so powerful that the Newton's cradle, the little balls that dink, dink, dink. Uh, when when Sid goes, says everyone freeze. Everyone freeze. They freeze. Yeah, like, the balls, Inanimate objects the freeze. Uh, which means that Sid has this jokingly has the power to stop time but as we'll talk about in pedagogy that time is very important to this film um the other thing i love is that uh he even sit as powerful as he is still has to do with this red tape that is all around hudsucker because when he asks how long it'll take to retype the uh the bumstead contract they say three hours, which is an <laughs> yeah. insane amount of time to print goes, out a contract. All right, give him another magazine. And then he says also, uh, he also says that he uh, he just needs the front page. Goes, no, and the guy just the first page. Now he gets distracted because the because uh, Norville's on fire. Mm-hmm. So he's a stop, get to, get out of there. You know, like he's not even telling him like worried about his safety. He's just like get out of here. Don't care. And then he opens the window and the pages go out. But before that, he says, just print me out the first page. And you can hear hesitance on the other side of the phone. Like, even that will take a way too long right. time. Just the front minutes. page. Yeah. So I love that. But let me talk about the double shit. Because he uh, jumps stitch. out the window going after the contract. And Norville grabs him by the ankle. Norville grabs him. I think it's funny because they go so far. I don't, I, and I don't know if I know what you're talking about in terms of like making a comment on it. I actually think that there's no comment. It's just a guy who's a nice guy who does a thing. I don't think there's a comment. I just think the joke's not funny enough to warrant casting an actor as the tailor, getting a set that's the tailor shop. You're laughing right now. It's stupid. It's so funny. So everyone, this is what the joke is. So while Musburger's hanging on, uh, well, his legs... uh, Norville's, holding, Norville's holding him by the pants. By the pants. And legs. he goes, pants. <laughs> yeah. And then he, it fades into like a three-part montage because his pants are ripping. Like So now his life, he's, his life is in, in these pants. In uh, these and pants, the, his hands. Uh, and so what happens, he's like, uh, it's this uh, tailor. He's like, I'm going to give you nice pants. I'm going to give you a double stitch. And then he's like, no, I told you I don't want a double stitch. Single stitch will be fine. And then he realizes it cuts back to Musburger hanging, and he realizes, like, I should have gone with the double stitch. Yeah. And then it cuts back to just the guy working on the pants alone, the tailor. The tailor. Late at night. Late at night. <laughs> and, and he says the following things. He says, ah, what the heck? Mr. Musburger is such a nice man. I give him double stitch anyway. That's some strong stitch. You better. You betcha. <laughs> That's some strong stitch. You betcha. <laughs> like, he's just so... Like, what makes the joke pure to me awesome is Musburger. that he just loves his job, and he's totally, he can totally be blind to the fact that Musburger is not a nice awesome guy. Musburger's mean to He's him. an asshole. <laughs> yeah. But he just loves life, and he's just a wonderful tailor <laughs> yeah. man, and he just wants to give people the best, because that's his business. Single and, stitch will be fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a good, he's a nicer man. So, that springboards the action of the plot, because now Norville is hailed as a hero for saving Musburger, which Musburger leans into. Norv is immediately made present. I'm sorry, I should call him Norville. I wrote Norv for short in my notes. He's made present of Hudsucker Industries. Uh, we, uh, our second epic montage because uh, the laughing montage yeah I'll go through it fast because I did it in little clauses but mm-hmm. this is sort of everything that happens in sequence and they're all plot threads and this is what makes the Coens genius like really parse how 
each bit of this montage is getting work done and moving us through the plot. And because of that, it's not just a montage. You're also like watching five scenes at once that yeah. are just simultaneous and all like without any dialogue. And man, the Coen brothers rip out their arsenal for this one. Yeah. There's so many good transitions and stuff. Right. So he's laughing. It freeze frames. Now he's in the newspaper. Uh, it cuts back to him. Now he's being shaved. Oh, this is an amazing shot. He's getting like a fancy shave at a barber's place. And the barber swings the chair around so that his face has stubble on it and cream on it. And then it goes out of frame. You see in the mirror that he was blocking in frame, the entire board looking at him like nodding, laughing like, yes, man. And he lifts up. And then he lifts up from the other side of frame and he's clean clean shaven. Amazing. And they do that. They do that all the time. There's another compositional cut where during... The tailor measuring, everyone's laughing he's and he's getting a measuring suit made. the tape. Yeah. And then it cuts to, it like zeroes in on the tape and then backs up and it's the stock tape because their stock is going super yeah. low. So, by contrast, apparently without him noticing, he's just laughing and having a great time, living the fancy life at the same time the stock is going down just as the, as the evil board want. Um, the newspaper starts calling him <laughs> uh, Idea Man. Let's see. Yeah, you said tape measure turns into a stock measure. Mm-hmm. Flash to Norville now in his office, the president's office, which I think this is important to bring up just for later's sake, is really spare. And God, well, we're on it. How, speaking of German expressionism, how amazing is Sid's office? Oh, it's got the clock. That's the, half right? a clock? Yeah, and it's yeah. super empty. There's no chairs. Like People come in and pay him homage. Yeah. They don't sit and have meetings. He's behind a chair with a cigar laughing. Right. And they come up and they say, please, sir, can I have some more? Like that's what <laughs> yeah. that room says. Yeah. So basically it ends with Norva laughing in his office and the whole montage, he's just been laughing. So it just ends with him laughing and it does the Godfather shot. We pull out of the office and the door shuts and it's like president. Now he's trapped in this cage. Now he is president. Uh, now we introduce <coughs> our supporting cast, the journalists. And yeah. uh, you got your John Mahoney's, R.I.P. Mm-hmm. You, you got, got your Jennifer Jason Lee And Bruce Campbell as Schmitty. And Bruce Campbell as Schmitty. I love later so they're like... Amy Archer is... She Jennifer probably wants Jason to be Lee. one of the boys. Probably is one of the boys, if you know what I mean. Has some guy friend, Tad, Chad, Schmitty. Yeah, perfect, Schmitty. Perfect, Schmitty. <laughs> I love how prophetic he is uh, in that sequence. But yeah, so they're... And their goal is to... Just like what they're falling into Musburger's plan, which is just that Norville's supposed to be an idiot. So there's an imbecile running the greatest company on the earth, and no one's talking about it. Let's cover it. And she's a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. The way she's Prize. introduced, uh, <laughs> what you said, Pulitzer Prize. Uh, oh, I did. Yeah. What's fun? People what's know what the you pun? mean. Prize. Prize. But what's <laughs> the pun that they make later in the movie when he's drunk? Norville says. Um, uh, Oh, with your, your, your prize healer pulls. Yeah, yeah something like something that. Something like that. Up. But um, anyway, the the way we're introduced to her is that she commands a room. She's in control. Amy even though Archer. she's not Amy Archer, but she's not <clears throat> she's not editor in chief. But John Mahoney's editor in chief. Yeah, but uh, they all make bets on the side, saying like, "I bet you she b- brings up her Pulitzer," and. Yeah. Of course, she doesn't until at the very end she blasts back in. I bet my Pulitzer on it. Yeah. And then they have to exchange money. And she's one of the guys. A better Hepburn than any of the real Hepburns. Like, this is my favorite Hepburn role in a film. She's, yeah. I mean, bringing up babies is pretty good. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, she is the best uh, modern day analysis of, like, someone who's close to Hepburn doing Hepburn that I've seen. And yet it's organic. It doesn't feel like an impression. It just feels like she was reincarnated as Jennifer Jason Lee. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, So basically she volunteers to be in on the assignment while being very ornery because she wants to go undercover and prove that he's an idiot because she smells bunk a mile away. Uh, Even though the EIC, the John Mahoney, the editor in chief says, they call him idea man, creator, innovator. Cerebrator. <laughs> As in like your Cere- cerebrum. Yeah. Yeah, cerebrator. cerebrator. And she goes, fake. He's a phony. And I'm going to prove it. I bet my bullets are on it. Um, Idea man's the bunk. So now we're, we cut the hex of Hutsucker. And Norville's using the elevator again. This is all apparently happened so suddenly. The Buzz is clearly not aware that he's the president now. 
Like he yeah. still goes, hey, buddy, how'd the blue letter go? Well, he doesn't mention the blue letter because we can't, we have to forget about it, but um, has a good buddy scene. Norval is on his way to meet Sid because he is worried about the stock, as you should be if you're president. Like the thrill is finally worn off, uh, off enough for him to be like, isn't it bad that the stock is plummeting? Mm-hmm. Sid basically says, don't worry, as you'd expect. Um, and Norval says, well, I think this idea could really save it and shows him his, his blueprint of his great idea, which again is just a circle. And basically Sid just says, sure, sure, and ignores him, gets in his car and takes off. Um, <clears throat> now we have one of my favorite scenes, which is the Izzy Wise scene. Because think about the problem before our filmmakers. Not a problem, but... They want all they want to accomplish with this scene is now she goes in Jennifer Jason Lee to a diner and uses her feminine wiles and lies to get Norville Barnes to buy her fake story so she can be undercover and get close to him. Any other filmmaker, I think most other filmmakers would just have that happen in a scene. You know what I mean? But they give two narrators these two cabbie guys saying like. And into the into the lunch, you know, like they're narrating as it's happening, and you don't actually hear what they're saying. Meaning, Norville Amy and, and Amy. Norville. What you we hear, hear is two guys at the diner watching them, guessing at what they're doing. Right, yeah. right. As if they're, which is one of the best things about the Coen Brothers because they're so fervidly show don't tell that you notice it when they just do the tell, and it kind of feels like a welcome rest you know because it's super dense super dense super dense and then this is a scene that's just like it's voiceover telling you what's happening and you already kind of know from the body language and yet it creates a game a visual game in the way in the same way that you might construct like an improv game she wouldn't right because they're trying to see how many story beats they can make clear with no dialogue using other people's dialogue because it's not just she comes in and she nails them the guys keep being unsure because Norville keeps seeming to get out of the scam. But you, the because audience... Because you're supposed to believe he is half imbecile. He's just too slow. You, the audience, can tell he's so dumb that he's not even falling for the like flags she's throwing out. He doesn't yeah. even pick them up because he's oblivious. Yeah. But what's amazing is the cab drivers don't narrate it as such. They keep being unsure and going like, well, maybe he's wise. Like, maybe he's the kind of guy you can't fool. Maybe he's acting that way to, yeah. like, counteract her move. They always come back to, uh, he don't, he look, don't wise. look wise. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, she eventually says her mom needs lumbago surgery or something. <laughs> and then she's just about to lose him. And she decides to pull out the big guns and faint. And that's when yeah. they're like, she wouldn't. She is. Yeah. And she is actually willing to f- fake faint. Yeah. So he carries her up to his office. Uh, she talks a mile a minute, basically telling her whole cover story. That's mm-hmm. all lies. He's out of breath because he's been carrying her scent from the diner. He smudges the door on the way in, which, if you'd have Abe tell it, is the reason the rest of the film unfolds as it does. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, everyone one of everyone's favorite moments. She has to fake knowing the Muncie fight song because mm-hmm. he starts singing it. It's the second she says, yeah, I'm from Muncie, Indiana, like you. He's like, well, you would know this then. Fight on, fight fight on, on dear old Muncie. Fight yeah. on, hoist the golden blue. I don't have it written. What's the rest? You'll tattered, torn, and hurting once the uh, months is, is done, done with, with you. you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Because the end, is, the end is complicated. And she's, she, she nails the you because that's obviously what like the rhyme would be. Yeah. But she's late on everything else. And the go eagle, she like... Like, in fact, she like stumbles Go with her hands. Eagles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's a good shot of Tim Robbins uh, just going crazy at close at camera with his little hands that he does his little eagle exactly. pantomiming. It's um, fantastic. They also have a great bit in that scene where she is drinking alcohol like it's nothing and he takes a sip and immediately <gasps> runs to the bathroom and you yeah. can hear him throw up. And while he's throwing up, she, these are two great visual yes. jokes. One, so she snoops. He, while he's throwing up, she immediately drops her facade. Address book. And goes and starts to look at shit. Also smokes a cigarette. On his, well, she smokes a cigarette. On his desk, she finds an address book, flips through it at inhuman super speed to find that the only thing he has is like in four months, he has a speech to the Junior Achievers Club. Yeah. Then she opens his desk drawer and a single pencil just <laughs> rolls from the back. 
from like yeah. the momentum. Like that is such a beautiful visual joke. The, and it's also information she already knows because it's like a Muncie oriented thing. And it's right, also it's like a Muncie pencil, achievers. but nothing that he's written with. So, yeah. I mean, you can gather together that she's obviously going to write a paper on him or write an article on him that mm. he's just a patsy because there's no signs of work whatsoever there, even though he just got the job. Right. But obviously it's true. He is a patsy. And his office is empty. Yeah. He tries to get her job in the mailroom, but the mailroom boss yells at him through the intercom because, again, no one is aware that he's president. Yeah. Uh, you, do, my favorite line about that is like, uh, look, I'm president of the company now. I don't care if you're president of the company. <laughs> I need that voucher. Yeah. Um, so instead he makes her his personal secretary, which I'm yeah. sure is what he wanted all along. And the, uh, she works for the Manhattan Argus. Is just That's like the name it. of the paper, yeah. yeah. So she immediately throws him under the bus. She comes out with her article, and her article basically provides evidence that he's a fucking idiot. Uh, let's see. That's when the crossword puzzle bit happens, but we don't need to go into it. Suffice to say, Amy Archer is capable to a superhuman level. Um, humiliates John Mahoney about how he used to think the idea man might be. He's like, I don't I thought, I think he's smart. They call him a cerebrator. She's like, no, he's dumb. I proved it. She mentions her Pulitzer again, which I think was funny because a joke I didn't notice until this time was she mentions in passing that she got her Pulitzer for a piece on the reunited triplets. Mm-hmm. And way later, the way he realizes that she's a fraud is he looks sadly at an article of her accepting her Pulitzer. And I never noticed right behind her in the Pulitzer acceptance oh, the photo triplets. are a priest, a salesman, and a farmer who are all identical. Yeah. <laughs> like just three random different, <laughs> just dudes different dudes who have the same face. Yeah. Um, so basically she feels like she has Norval wrapped around her finger. Uh, she tells Schmidt, a.k.a. Bruce Campbell, that she can smell a real story here. Why would they hire an idiot? He's so obviously an idiot, they must know he's an idiot, and she's going to get to the bottom of it. She's really the main character in the sense that she drives all the change as it unfolds. Yes, yes. Because Norval's totally being buffeted by the winds in whatever direction. Classic, like, uh, yeah, I mean, like, that's... Big Lebowski has that, too. You know, like, just the fool, the fool's era, and a lot of film noir does it, too, which is also a visual kind of part of this visual pastiche that is Hudsucker Proxy, right. I'd argue, because everything's very starkly lit and et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, now we're tracking their personal relationship as well as the work relationship. He's pissed and humiliated about the article, which was titled Imbecile Heads Hudsucker. Mm-hmm. So he calls his new secretary in to dictate a nasty Amy. letter to herself because she wrote the article. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the purpose of the scene basically is just to leave Amy Archer feeling bad about what she yeah. did. Um, but at the same time, it's a, again, each scene is like an improv game, yeah. but written, obviously. But the game is always so strong. And I love the game always. The game is always kind of the same, especially depending on who's involved in the game. Like, mm-hmm. So if it's Norville, it's that he's missing the point. He knows less than he, he should. He knows less than he should. And there's little there's unique ways they hint at it. Like one of my favorite jokes in the dictation of the letter is that he argues that one of the... You're such, he argues to Amy Archer, you are a bad writer. I bet you couldn't even get published in Amazing Tales magazine. (laughs) As if to say, like, this is a stupid periodical. You can't even write for this stupid thing. Although what he says. And then at the end, he argues that he's like, like, you wouldn't even get, he repeats himself and then says, a publication that I, for a long time, yeah, have enjoyed. No, he says you would. Although I think perhaps maybe your article would be better suited to the pages of Amazing Tales. Although I doubt you could find a home at Amazing Tales, a periodical which I have enjoyed for many years, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Because so, yeah. I love that he also tells her, like, you know, and wrap up the letter as you would from this point. Like, et cetera, et cetera. Which is another <laughs> way of saying that he hasn't even... He hasn't even, he's not even at home at his new position. He can't say his new position in his name and all that. Right. Although he does tell her, uh, throw out the letter, I just need a vent. It's no big deal. Right. Which sort of gives a window into like, oh, he's emotional, but he's empathetic. He's a nice guy. Like he's dummy, but he's... An, a, has a heart. Yeah. And then of course he goes too far because to make himself feel better, he's like, and she's probably one of these fast talking, cigarette smoking tomboys that'll never have a land a husband, you know? Yeah, probably ugly. Yeah, yeah probably has a friend named Schmidt, as we said. Basi- uh, basically gets, uh, goes too far, goes too hard on Amy Archer. So Amy Archer slaps him. And what I love about that bit is he doesn't, 
It makes sense that he doesn't know why she slapped him, but his reaction is a total non sequitur because he goes like, uh, so I thought, I don't know, how about we go grab dinner and a show? Slap. I was thinking the king and I slap. How about Oklahoma? Oklahoma? (laughs) Yeah, like he thinks he offended her with the wrong show choice. Yeah. So it's the same game. And then, of course, my favorite Jennifer Jason Lee line in the movie. Only a numbskull thinks he knows things about things he knows nothing nothing about. about. I love that. And she storms off. And is that when she meets? Yeah, that's when she meets uh, Moses. Yes. She sneaks into the clock tower's workings. Yeah. And I love that scene a whole bunch because it gives us a an intro into like what Moses is all about. But also it does some cool visual narration of like, so... We'll talk about it in pedagogy, uh, pedagogy, but if we think about Moses as like a clockmaker, like he's the one who's like dictating time for he this keeps building. The clock running, he keeps the clock which running, which we later learn apparently controls and I just, the flow of time in the yeah, universe. And yeah. I just want for us later when we mention it for you to remember that that when she like puts her hand on a railing, she gets like grease on her hand, and he throws her like a towel yeah. to wipe it off. I think that's an interesting moment in terms of symbolism, but I won't go into it here. Okay. But what they essentially talk about right is before that, that scene, sorry. Yeah. What? On her way sneaking in, we can't leave this out. She checks his desk again and it turns oh, out yeah. that his speech to the junior <laughs> achievers club has been canceled. <laughs> yeah, it's then just, she goes into the clock. He's proceed. basically Millhouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, so it goes into the, and she basically says uh, to him, like, he knows way too much about just like their workplace and like what's going on and who's doing the schemes. And like, he's just right on their level somehow. He's the narrator. He's the it's narrator. He gets magic. it. Yeah. He's like, yeah, this is what's happening. He's a patsy. Cause they're yeah, trying to take I don't tell stock. nobody nothing unless they ask. That's just old Moses's way. <laughs> uh, and he basically points out that you're like, what? why are you doing this? And she was like, because we need to like point out that he's an imbecile and stuff like, no, why are you doing this? And he's asking a more personal question. He's like, you're not happy doing this. Like you're, you, you know, he's a little bit right about you just being, he, he doesn't explicitly say it, but like the subtext is, you know, you just aren't happy just being one of the guys as he's pointing out. That's mm-hmm. why what he said bothered you. She's like, I'm, I'm happy enough. And he goes, and he just starts laughing and then she says, I'm plenty happy. Yeah. So she is also running away from something about herself that she doesn't like. Which, of course, because it's a classic Hollywood tale, is true love. She has to be with Norville and be in right, true love. Right, because it's Hollywood. Um, she has a wall up and she needs it taken down, yeah. I'm plenty happy. Yeah. Uh, I also like the line in there. Yeah, she just is like, how do you know Norville's smart? And he just goes, you know, for kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the scene after that too, because then it shows how prophetic Norville is about Amy's workplace. Because she's uh, first, she says something. He says, "Easy there, guy." <laughs> so she's one of the guys, uh, and then she immediately says, "Does this suit make me look mannish?" And then Bruce Campbell slaps her in the ass, which is crazy. Oh boy. And then says, "Come on, let's go get a highball." <laughs> so it's just like all the things that Norville said one after another. Are, is true Come apparently true, right. so like he is kind of smart yeah or he's unwittingly right and i don't know if we should go down the rabbit hole of other cohen saying a woman can't be a career gal but i think they're at least saying in this instance this character wants a romantic relationship and she's not opening herself up to it because that's how she changes by the yeah, end yeah she's doing what she wants she's also one of the best in her field yeah So she wants to print the true story that he's like a patsy and they're intentionally tanking the stock. John Mahoney's like, that's crazy. We're not going to print that. Uh, And to me, in retrospect, that makes sense from John Mahoney's perspective. Because what is she going to say? An unknown source who's this old man who works in a clock tower told me this and let's publish it. Right. right. I got (laughs) to protect my source, a magic clock tower maker. Um, But anyway... Because you're the audience and you know she's right, you want her to get the article published. But the truth doesn't come out. Uh, She slaps Bruce Campbell. She slaps everyone. Slams the cigar case shut. Storms out. She doesn't quit yet. That's later. Okay. We parade to the party because now... The fancy dress ball. The fancy dress ball because they want to parade him around to show how stupid he is to the investors. And he doesn't disappoint. And he doesn't disappoint. He insults 
almost all of the ones that we see. I love that it starts off with uh, the Norvils between these two large pink dressed ladies. Uh, and the, the, they also have his problem is they don't understand like words well. Because they make, uh, it's a folly adieu. Yeah, yeah. Which is a folly. Like, it's just, that's a nice. Your companion is an ode, a lyric. Mm. Are you betrothed? (laughs) Are you betrothed? Uh, It turns out one of them is Sid's wife, which is important later. Yeah. Only in so far as apparently wearing Hudsucker is in love with this woman yeah. in the pink dress. And, uh, and so uh, Musburger parades him around. They meet up he with the Texan and yeah. the Finn. He insults them both because he, uh, the Texan mishears, mishears and he him. calls him timid. He calls him timid. And then uh, the Finn, he says something in Finnish, I believe. That turns out to be insulting. That turns out to be... Yeah. And I love that shot where he's... Just the efficiency of the guy. He throws his martini in his face and then with one hand and then smacks him with the right hand. Also, like, well, first his wife over his shoulder screams, screams yeah. and then he throws a drink in lens and punches yeah. the and lens. And that's the thing the Coen brothers love. They love people f- reacting very largely, especially the supporting roles. Because Miller's at the crossing has top it. of this film also, when which is a time hits, that you would scream. When wearing splats. But yeah. they really focus on that woman really screaming at a continuous note for a very long time. But I think you should note in that shot there's also a guy on the right side of frame who's just going like shaking his head like, oh, that's shame. a shame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so everyone's different. I um, guess. Peter Gallagher comes in pretending to be Frank Sinatra with bigger eyebrows and sings God, a song. God, I love when he goes to why. his drink and then <laughs> yeah. pulls away and starts singing again. It's like, it's like he's just, I'm so handsome, I got to give you this angle, but the song's still going. Right. But the important thing in the scene is it's the first time we get like a love moment between our two destined lovers. And uh, you already described it, but it's a beautiful moment. It's a very well lit, beautiful thing. And I think, and I'm going to save it for pedagogy, which we are almost to, but I think it's one of the key pedagogy scenes as well. Um, But they discuss reincarnation. He says she's a gazelle because she's so elegant and beautiful. Or an ibex. Or an ibex. Or an... Well, that's him. Yeah, no, that that wouldn't. Antelope or an ibex. He asks her for a kiss for luck. She kisses him. There's romance music, which lets you know that we're supposed to be pro them kissing. Yeah. Very Capra-ish, very Gershwin-ish. Yeah. Uh, And actually, all throughout, well, that's how he do that. So I want to get through the Uh, plot. Yeah. Apparently, this gives him the confidence that the next day he walks in and he pitches the hula hoop. Yep. Then we get the greatest montage ever put to film, in my opinion. Into a uh, da- saber dance. Yeah, Kachachuri and saber dance. Which is... You got it. Often used at circuses and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Used expertly in this to take us all the way in very short order. I think It's like five, six minutes. From he pitches it to they make this thing, they price it, they roll it out, it struggles in the marketplace. They try to name it. They name it. It ca- it finally catches on because one kid starts using it and then more. And we are going to unpack this. But this montage gets you through all of that to the point where wearing stock is higher than it's ever been. Mm. Hudsucker stock. I, I thought it was a nice touch during the name to show how much time has passed. You get the sense that because you don't see people over and over and over. You see everyone doing it all at once. So this could be a week. But they do this one thing when they're in the name in it. In the foreground, there's a secretary, and she's reading two novels, one of which is War and Peace. War and Peace, then War and Peace Part 2, then Anna Karenina. Yeah, yeah, which is like, these are huge books. Also, German expressionists. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then in the background over her shoulder is a box or with Russian crisp sorry. silhouettes in it, which is yeah. also expressionist in the same yeah. way. And the silhouettes are the dudes trying to name the thing. Of course, they land on Hula Hoop. But there's Guys, other good... I got it. Yeah, like the Sears. One circle. of those, by the way, Sam Raimi. First of all, Musburger's disdain as he approves the project is so amazing. No, of course, it's genius. Even a blind man could tell you. There's enormous demand. There'll be enormous demand for this... Uh, this, uh, this. Congratulations, kid. You've outdone yourself. Yeah. And then later, he calls it a dingus offhanded. Which is lady. how they use... How they talk about it. The blueprint for, the rest for of the it film. is called extruded plastic dingus. I wrote dingus. that down too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> extruded plastic dingus. But what I love, again, is the classic just improv game of slap this on top of there. That'll make it funnier. 
is for his presentation, Tim Robbins hula hoops the entire time. Mm-hmm. So as he's talking, it's doing that. We even put thing. a little bit of sand to make the more the, the and then sensation I, more pleasant. Amazing to me is the end shot right before the epic montage is a classic what's called a doorway dolly shot. Very common. If someone's going to say a real high energy scene like line, scene ending line, you push in on their face real fast and then they say the line. Well, he goes, they go like, is it okay if we produce the hula hoop, Mr. President? And it pushes in on him and he goes, well, I'm for it. Yeah. But he's still hula hooping yeah. and they hold so on him shaky. for too long. Yeah. So it's that like family guy beat of a joke where like for a second his face is just bobbing in and out of frame and then it cuts. It's so funny to me. Yeah. Um, so they do the greatest montage ever filmed. Literally just if you haven't seen this movie and don't even want to watch it, you have to see the hula hoop montage where the little kid hula hoops. It's killer. Yeah, it's it's great. It's it's good music set. Like it's perfect music for it. It's also um, like amazing shots because they had to catch just like earlier in the film with the w- wind with the paper. They had to have a hula hoop perform in a way. They had to have great hula hoop artists who are good at like rolling. There's hoops. a shot where the storekeeper and- throws out a dozen hula hoops. And the one red hula hoop that we're going to follow as our subject is the only one that doesn't fall over and keeps rolling yeah. forward. They must have waited it or something. No, I mean, yeah. Yeah, they probably I did don't know, something but like it's that. an amazing and they shot. And ma- they did it with shots and stuff, but it like changes direction and goes down alleys. Like It's pretty insane. And these crisp lines and shapes we're talking about, they do the overhead shot where the circle of the hula hoop lying on the ground is around the kid's head as he gets the idea of, oh, this is a hula hoop. I should do this with it. Then he steps inside it, and now it has him. And a bunch of neighborhood kids see him hula hooping, and it makes the hula hoop super successful. Some of the neighbor kids' faces as they see the hula hoop are so amazed that, like, this is the best toy. It's like I feel like me watching the Dreamcast E3 as a kid or something. And I love also just uh, compositional, you know, like, resonance, like, this it's the same insert of him saying it's a dollar fifty nine, taking it out in ten sex ten cents until it's just a sticker free that's free with any purchase. Free with yeah. any purchase. And then of course it's just the reversal of that. And then at the end they put on like a three ninety nine yeah. sticker when it's finally success. So now the whole world and did you notice when we come out of that montage, did you notice who was doing the narration as the newsman? No. Maurice Lamarche? John Goodman. Oh, because I read on IMDb, this is the second movie with John Goodman and so and so together, and I was like, like, John yeah. Goodman wasn't in this. Yeah, you oh, can okay. if you you can kind of hear it. He's doing a really good impression of that old timey news talker. A city but, on the grow. Yeah, like and it, and for couples who are getting into the swing of things, Johnny you know, Papes here. So he, and it's just a newsreel that is just a, another montage. I mean, they're kings it's of montage. It's another montage with narration, essentially. But you're it's supposed to be watching exposition. what's on TV, and it's just hula hoop is taking over the nation. Eisenhower calls to congratulate him on inventing mm-hmm. the hula hoop. It cuts to Norville having the greatest successes. Makes yeah. a hoopla joke. Everyone he makes loves. a pun, and then of course you can see by the end of the montage they're over it. Like he doesn't play the game. He's just excited that he's winning. Uh, and he makes the hoopla joke again and no one laughs this time. So it's like, it's a montage that actually changes. It isn't just like a Rocky montage, which is also a great montage, but it's just slightly getting better doing the same yeah. thing. Is this one? It's like, it moves. It's story. It has it's story. It's amazing beats. that it accomplishes. Oh, we're so happy. He's finally getting a taste of success and he deserved it. The hula hoop was a good idea. Oh, now he's sitting on his laurels too much. Oh, now he has a big head. That's a lot to accomplish in one montage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when we get out of that, we cut back to the board of directors scene. Right. Where they now are all in despair. Because they the could stocks, have been worth millions. But they all sold their stock because it was supposed stocks. to go down. And, of course, Sid is getting a massage. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he's just got to be the most powerful guy in the room. And the guy whose name I did look up, but I refuse to refer to him as anything other than eyebrows. Eyebrows, one of the board members, despairs, tries to jump out the window. Turns out Sid has had it replaced with plexiglass. Plexiglass. Had it installed yesterday. Um, So that's just straight up slapstick hilarity. Um, But basically, it's if you're familiar with the rules of Hollywood film structure, it's the bad guys close in. So now the bad guys reformulate. Sid's like, don't worry. 
Uh, he says, so the kid caught a wave. Right now, he and his dingus are on top, which is <laughs> needlessly <laughs> sexual. Yeah. Sure, sure. Right now, he and his dingus are on top. But I say we made this chump and we can break him. So now he vows that like Norville must be fully destroyed because he had a good idea. So now the only thing they can do is disgrace him and, and take him out of the presidency. Sure, sure. The music plays. The wheel turns. And our spin ain't over yet. Um, we cut into Norville's office to find that it is now the opposite of where it was before in terms He's of now set dressing. becoming Sid. Or at least wearing Hudsucker or one of these guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's getting a massage as well. He's getting a massage, a weird temple massage with vibrating hand things. He's getting his nails soaked. Someone is making a sculpture of him. Yeah. Um, and a string quartet is playing Brahms <laughs> for him yeah. uh, while he smokes a cigar. And you're right in this scene, and I think that that's why, and it's very notable. He says several things Sid said to him. It's almost like that Futurama episode where the guy from the 80s gets unfrozen. <laughs> Don't worry about blank. Let me worry about we're, blank. We're, yeah, because it's yeah. like the powerful guy said he likes me and I want to be that guy and he likes me. So I'm going to say what he said. <laughs> exactly. Because so he seems to make sense. And he'll do that again in the next scene. But, okay, so this scene is Amy Archer comes in and says, you know, I used to like you a lot better when you had a soul, basically. Uh, you told me the hoop was going to bring a smile to the hips of everyone in America, regardless of race, creed, or color. Finally, there would be a thingamajig that would bring everyone together, even if it kept them apart spatially. Man, we write down the same things. Cause, yeah. And you jump into it fast. I was like, I was waiting to say that line. You've and blocked then... a few that I wrote down. Okay, Don't good. worry. Okay, good. Um, I'm just trying to get us to pedagogy. A thingamajob. She says, uh, you know, I used to love you, but I don't anymore. And she quits and yeah. leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then there's a dream sequence that I don't fully understand that I want to talk about in pedagogy. Right. Where Norville is dancing, dancing with, with a lady uh, in a white void. Yeah. Um, that fades to him waking up all sweaty in his office again. Because basically this is a saga of Norville's an asshole now. Yeah. Buzz comes in and pitches the bendy straw. Which is, as, he's, as Norville's becoming Sid and his language in the scene as well, like he doubles down after the Amy conversation. We don't conversation. crawl here at Hudsucker. Notice how time. Buzz is just regurgitating the pitch of Norville. Yeah. You know, for, you know, for, you know, uh, for drinks. For drinks. And I call the, it the Buzz Sucker. And that way, the, uh, that way the people don't have to lose an arm and a leg. And then he gets interrupted, but arm and a leg is the line that he used during his original pitch. It's got these ridges on the side that give it its whammy, buddy. See, you don't have to drink like this anymore. No, you can drink like this. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, to me, this is the funniest scene in the movie in terms of how many times I laugh. Yeah, it's just so That's funny. what makes me love Buzz so much. But, yeah. buddy, I love when he says, uh, an example needs to be made. Uh, uh, you're, you're fired. Yeah. And then Buzz immediately laughs. And then he sees that he's being serious what? and he looks yeah. behind himself like to see if, did he fire someone else? Yeah. No, it's him. And then he starts wailing like a little baby and begging and he fires. Please anyway. buddy. And is it not amazing how Tim Robbins and they, a lot of producers wanted them to go with someone else. And they said, it has to be Tim Robbins. Right. He can be smiling with his eyes wide open and either emanate total kind, loving naivete and then a scene later, you see him in the newspaper and he's smiling and his eyes are wide open, but these like tiny changes in his facial musculature, you're like, now he's full of himself. Now he's a dick. It's yeah. amazing how he can get that just I actually the eyes. had that same thought because uh, the role that I thought of the closest to this, actually it was a more recent film, Burn After Reading, mm -hmm. and I thought that Brad Pitt in that movie has that too, is that he has this little nuance of smile like, smile like a dummy, smile like this, smile like now that, smile, smile like sad. sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just, like, very small little ticks of musculature. In As great directors and adherents of lots of rehearsal, they often get performances out of actors that are the best of their career. I think that's Brad Pitt's best pure acting. Yeah. And he has a lot of good roles, but... It's when you see that you're impressed by his nuance. They let and him shit. out, and yeah. this yeah, he's like, oh, I'm actually working on with people who know what they're talking yeah. about. So meanwhile, as we climb to the climax, haha, terrible pun. Musburger's in his office, being told by his spy, the bald mechanic dude who's evil for no reason or depends oh, on ISIS. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Amy Archer's actually an undercover reporter. 
He goes, oh shit, I can use that against Norval. Invites Norval to an empty boardroom, which is lit amazingly. It's the same boardroom we've been seeing, but it's lit totally differently. Roger Deakins. Beautiful. Deacons, baby, Roger Deacons. And uh, basically says, we're pushing you out. We're going with this new narrative, is in so many words. You were made a chump by this reporter, so that doesn't look good. Um, Buzz came up with the hula hoop. You yeah. stole it from him gonna... because you saw his Buzz sucker blueprint. And they're so similar, the pitches, that <laughs> right. it must have been you stealing from him. <laughs> right. And in business, you get no second chances. So uh, basically says, you're out, kids. Sorry. Uh, when you're dead, you stay dead. Don't believe me. Ask wearing a sucker. I love also the attention to detail in like, depending on the circumstances, flipping little turns of phrase, like little sound sound bites, like... Once you're dead, you're dead. So you stay dead or whatever. That That's used again time and time again. But right before that, he says, short way up, long way down. Yeah. Like in earlier in the scenes, they said it, every step that uh, every se- step that the HUD Wearing made was, was a step, was up. step up until his last one. <laughs> yeah. And then also the joke in the elevator oh in the first God. scene with Buzz where he's like. There's three great jokes. Yeah. When is the sidewalk fully dressed, buddy? When it's There's wearing a, HUD sucker. sucker. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but one of the jokes is uh, what takes like 30 years to get to the top and only 30 seconds to get down. Why not, sucker? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just... Uh, and I think the third one gets interrupted, you're right, because he goes like, and what's a holy crap? Is that a blue letter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, have you... <laughs> but of course, this everything that's happening devastates poor old Norval um, because he assumes that right. he's out and that Amy Archer doesn't love him anymore and that she betrayed him in this horrible way. It turns out Amy Archer didn't write the story about Buzz, and in fact, that story was planted by Sid through Bruce Campbell. So, like, Bruce Campbell's connection on the board is clearly Sid Musburger, and Sid Musburger just feeds him propaganda stories that the company wants out. Fox News. So, basically, Mm -hmm. the Argus is going to run with it anyway because it's a great story. She doesn't want them to because she loves Norville, so she quits. Um, I did realize because of this scene, at the end, when she hits Bruce Campbell with a purse and he turns his head to profile, wearing a fedora... Bruce Campbell should play Dick Tracy. Oh, he's got that jawline. <laughs> he's, he looks exactly like Dick Tracy from the comic books. That's Way so more than Warren Beatty did. That's but so anyway, funny. I mean like back in time. It's impossible to make happen now, no, yeah. but it should have been Bruce Campbell instead of Warren Beatty. So been, anyway. That would have been excellent. The HUD board, the board of directors, uh, are then watching footage. It's such a crazy plan that would only work in the 50s. They want to try to make him dismissed as president because he's insane there's this freudian guy that they hired who's clearly just on their payroll who's like a sigmund freud stand yeah. who says yeah he's really gloomy and he acts mopey <laughs> these are signs that he's dangerously criminally yeah, insane it's a cycle and he's spiraling yeah out of and him. he's like if you want me to sign a thing that has him locked up doing electroconvulsive therapy and lobotomized i'll sign it like let's do this thing right um so you know that that's the fate that's in store for him He's drunk out of his mind at the juice bar where at we New finally Year's get Eve. Buscemi. Steve Buscemi's there, and I, I love the painting of the scene that we learned that he's been just bar hopping, and he's gotten a martini at every one, but Steve Buscemi's like, we don't sell it's alcohol a juice here. Bar. It's a juice bar, and he's like, I'll have a martini. Yeah. <laughs> and it's this, just like, he says it like four times. I thought the dialogue really shown here, the dialect, where he goes like, but I thought you served misfits. Like, I am a misfit. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, daddy, that's a big Roger. But I told you, we don't serve alkyhool. It's a juice and coffee bar, man. Yeah. <laughs> like he's so beat Nicky. And I love yeah. that it's also hinting at when in that scene before when they were talking about the antelopes and the ipex and the gazelles, uh, she references, because she was actually falling in love with them, she gets caught in her own line. She says, I go to this beatnik bar every year. And he's like, every year? But you just moved here. He's like, well, I... I'd like to think that I'll go every year from now <laughs> yeah. on if it's good. Uh, so this is an indication that she said that and she screwed up because she's starting to like Norville here. And he, he still likes her. And he remembered that's one of the few true things she told him. And so, so he, he's coming here. He's going to like come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause she's a Muncie girl after all. Um, which is a lie, but, and that's the, he still doesn't get it. He, yeah. By even at the end of the movie, he's like, I can't believe you would lie to me about all this shit. Yeah. You, 
a Muncie girl. So Amy, which should, is not true. Right before that, Amy enters and she's like, "I've seen three types of Norville. I've seen the guy, like the go getter. I've seen the, the guy who's head. on tie, who's on top, who's kind of an insufferable asshole. But I've never seen the quitter, and I don't like it." And he goes, and, "Well, too bad. I'm all washed up." Homo sapiens sapicus as he's <laughs> drunkenly like stumbling yeah. over. So the whole beat is that she's just like rebuking him for, you know, like you, you shouldn't quit. Get back to the first Norville. And he's just like, everyone hears lies and they're all fast talking and I'm not made to be here because they all just, when your dad, what your dad asked, yeah. wearing hat still quoting Sid. That's, he still keeps quoting Sid in the scene. And I think that's the movies, the battle for Norville's soul. And Sid is the devil, and yeah. you know he's at his worst when he literally takes words out of Sid's mouth. Yeah, yeah, it's just poisoning with hemlock, and uh, of course the uh, everything and the reason why it's not a tragedy, it's a comedy, is things like this. As he's going out there, and he's like blaming her, and he's like, "You lied to me you, for being You're Amy Muncie. Archer." He's like, "But from a, mu- I wouldn't expect it. I'd expect it from them, but not a Muncie girl." Which of course she isn't from Muncie. And she so. sings the Muncie fight song to try and encourage him, yeah. and slowly breaks down crying. Beautiful acting. And he he fight, and she's also good. He fights it. Like he's mean. Yeah. He, but also like when she starts singing it, she's he's touching him. Like you see he's all like the, he's yeah. like about to buckle. Right. Uh, but he's like, no, no, I can't, no. And then he runs. He stalls out. He uh, tangent. I gotta point out. He passes a paper boy selling the story that he's nuts. Yeah. As a special New Year's Eve edition, it is New Year's Eve tonight. Uh, that paper boy is so fucking smart. <laughs> Just as a side note, because he says lines that the Cohen scripted. And there's no way the paper boy sat down and pre-scripted lines that I'm going to say on the corner. Oh, right. But he's like, idea man, kaput. His ideas are ersatz. And I'm like, that paper boy's such a good writer. It's Johnny Paves. That's Johnny yeah. Paves as a child. Ideas prove ersatz. This just in. Extra, extra. Then we get that classic Capra montage that the Simpsons have made fun of so many times to such rotating effect. heads on blackness as yes. he's running through. Um, this on this one, or he's not running. He's running towards. He's walking towards camera in a black void. Yeah, and transparencies pass over him, and just sound bites of what all the characters represent to him at this the, moment. The joke in this one is. Eisenhower comes back to say, Norville, you let me down. You let Mrs. Eisenhower down. You let the American people down. Which is quoting, or because he got a phone call when he was at his highest high. But you got to know, the best, I know this is neither here nor there, it's going to be a long episode, buckle in. The best use of that thing ever is one of the Simpsons ones. And it's one of my favorite jokes in terms of, if you parse the joke structure, how beautifully it's built. It's in the Treehouse of Horror when Homer thinks his whole family's dead, Omega Man, I think, and he goes, "Oh <laughs> I God, think I know which one. little Bart!" And Bart <laughs> yeah. transparently swings a bat, and you hear it crack a baseball. And he goes, "Little Lisa," you see Lisa swing a bat, but you hear her miss. It just goes. Whoop. He goes, "Little Marge," and she swings a baseball bat, and just nothing happens. Then he goes. And the rest, and <laughs> the dog, the cat, Maggie, and the TV go by. <laughs> so good. Just non sequitur surrealism is yeah. Like it, it's got to be like sec. It's got to be surrealist for a point. I don't like Tim and Eric stuff, but this shit gets me. Yeah, this shit really gets me. Uh, uh, so, so he meets up with Buzz, who's now with uh, Anna Nicole Smith, who's Zsa Zsa Gabor, Zsa, yeah. clearly. Who he was dating earlier. <coughs> yeah. So now Buzz has been obviously... Just taking his life. Buzz is the new him. Buzz is going to be the new dope president, yeah. etc. But I love that Buzz says, uh, How come you did that, buddy? I heard that hoop was a swell idea. Sid says it was my idea. Sid says you stole it. So I love a guy, the idea of a guy that's so dumb that someone's like, you know this unrelated thing? That was your idea, dude. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, it yeah, was. It was. Yeah. Uh, I also like that he, it's the long-standing Coen Brothers tradition that when someone punches someone, they land several feet away. They, like fly back. So Buzz yeah. punches it because then uh, uh, Zaza goes. Uh, pop him one. Yeah, pop him one already. And then he hits him. And uh, Norville flies into the street. Uh, the crowd literally chases him. Yeah. Like, I love the idea that. Even if you did hear, oh, there's an executive. It turns out he's an idiot and he stole an idea. If you saw him in the street, would you be like, let's get him, everyone? Yeah, they become the angry mob and he's Frankenstein's Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, Yeah, they they, chase him. Well, they don't have pitchforks, but I love that this is the first time that we've seen the the car... um, 
way too fast. Uh, just the Sunnyvale rest home. The people car. who are coming to take him away to the insane asylum. Yeah. Insane asylum. Yeah. And uh, the, the orderlies come out and one of them's just got a stray jacket, but the other has this huge net. Like they're tr- trying to catch a dog. Which is straight from Looney Tunes. Yeah. In Looney Tunes, whenever someone was getting taken to the funny farm, a big butterfly net would come down. Yeah. Right. And it's just hilarious to me that... They're there that fast, but everyone is just immediately the world has turned on you. I also just want to point out because our next episode is Fargo. Woo! Woo. Um, the same team working on consecutive movies, like in all the key positions, it's the same team. The way this whole sequence is in snow, and Fargo, of course, is entirely in snow. The ability to evoke different feelings and different looks in the same like environment. I, I have to compare it to like Ween or something like <laughs> Ween is a band that can do and has done every genre. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing to me that they can shoot this snow scene and then the next movie, it feels like Fargo, where the snow is heavy and shitty and you hate the snow. Um, but this is like the magic of the snow. Anyway, Deacons for the win, always. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, those guys join the mob. I love this shot, which I never got before. Norville runs into the side of the Hudsucker building but it's shot with the camera rotated 90 degrees, yeah. which kind of foreshadows hitting the ground. That's like the hitting the ground that he'll never complete. Yeah. It also does. It's the same uh, notion of the wind pushing off his bust. Yeah. And like, so it says Barnes. He sees, he finally sees the finished statue of his and head. Then, and uh, it looks cruel. And, this, <laughs> and another German take uh, from Fritz Lang. Mm-hmm. Is that you see his shadow, kind of like Nosferatu style, yeah. you know, like where you see this haunting shadow of himself. So there's now in the shot as he enters Hudsucker's lobby on New Year's Eve, the same day that, uh, you know, uh, Hudsucker died. A year ago. A today. year later. Yeah, right. just a year later. What ends up happening is you see the sh- uh, Norville Barnes, the shadow of the man, and Norville and Barnes, the trophy of the man. The image that was projected. Yeah, and yeah. now, so now we have our two things, and forward and central oh, to frame great. is the elevator, which then kind of tells you his choice. Choose, yeah, Angel Devil. Amazing. So he does choose, and we see that sort of he is chosen to be humble and in his last moments, because on a whim he goes up to the president's office where creepy bald guy is putting Sid's name on the door now. Mm-hmm. And we actually cut to Sid, who's figuring out what the company will be named when he inevitably takes over. Sid Sucker. Settles Indus- on Sid Sucker Industries. Yeah. Um, the Fuddrucker prophecy. Yeah. But uh, anyway, <laughs> he goes into his office. He gets his old mailroom apron. And you get the impression it's not because he remembers the blue letter. It's to, like, be humble. He wants to be the old Norville when he dies. And he goes out the window. He decides to jump off. Then he decides he won't jump off. But because he smudged that guy's door, I guess. Elosius locks him out with a window. The bald dude locks him out. Yeah. Um, So he eventually falls and is falling through the air, falling through the air. Oh, God, what's going to happen? Suddenly time freezes. Well, Moses stops the clock. Yes. By putting in his broom. His broom handle in the workings of the clock. We don't know that just yet, but it's revealed while this is happening. He looks directly at camera and says, strictly speaking, I'm never supposed to do this, but do you have a better idea? Which I feel like is really the director saying, yeah, we're fucking doing this. Yeah, We're going to break the system. Whatever. Sorry. Yeah. So Warren Hutsucker appears to Norville as an angel and tells him that, did you actually deliver the blue letter, the one thing that was your job? And he's like, no, I don't. I, I, I lost it. And he's like, no, you put it where you left it. In your pocket. Which is in your pocket or your heart. You know. So like, he reads it. It's his suicide note in which he says all the things that are now true of Norville. I let my success become my identity. I foolishly played the big man and seen my life become empty as a result. I even drove away she who could have saved me. Who, in his case, it turns out, is Sid's wife. And I love all the times that, uh, just to make sure to hit home, if it wasn't clear already that Norville's kind of a dunce, every time he says fall or fail, he says the wrong one. Yeah. Because the new president. If I, must- should f- if I should fall, fail! Yeah. If I should fail, fall! <laughs> yeah. Not counting the mezzanine. Yeah. So, but basically, the letter is a deus ex machina, which someone uh, also pointed out online. It's literally like from the machine, if you consider where the Hudsucker industry yeah. has like a system. Yeah, it's really cool. God in the machine. Their deus ex machina is literally an angel from the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the letter says, 
whoever you assign to be president inherits all my stock. I assume it'll be you, Sid, but if it's not, and then he says, tough titty toenails, yeah. which means magically Norville is still president. No one can put him in the insane asylum or fuck with him in any way. He just wins. It's which like a get out of jail free card. Isn't really true if the if like society's rules, but it, for a storybook, it's, it's not fine. true because they would try again to prove he's insane. Yeah, or have a clause yeah. that removes him, but it's magic. Yeah, it's magic fifties time. So, yeah, failure, the message is literally spelled out for us. Failure should never lead to despair. <clears throat> for despair looks only to the past in business and in love. The future is now when our future president needs it. Wearing Hudsucker hereby bequeaths him a second chance. The other huge theme of the movie is second chances. Yeah. Uh, um, Kar- karma. Karma. <laughs> uh, That's meanwhile, uh Moses and uh, Alan Isis keep fighting Action in the Action sequence. <laughs> and it's like this fight scene. Not the literal, but the figurative uh, good and evil is fighting for the his soul, I guess. And uh, he uh, Moses punches him, and his uh, Alanisus's dentures fall dentures out. fall out, which he then uses to buy himself a little bit of time by putting that in the gears as well, which I thought was interesting. Which stops Norville just long enough that his fall... His second fall is only like a few feet from Which the, is amazing to me that from his perspective all this happened. It's like the Indiana Jones conundrum. He just gets up and goes, Yahoo! Now I can save my company. Whereas I would be like, the afterlife exists. Right. Holy shit. Like, I am crazy. Yeah. Maybe I'm crazy. Because I just fell super far, and then I fell a little far. And, and I then thought I, I saw an angel. And then, yeah. apparently, I only fell a few feet, and that doesn't hurt me, so I can go run with my blue lighter. But instead, he's just good to go. He goes back to the juice bar and kisses Amy Archer like a goddamn rabid wolverine. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you notice? They yeah. go hard. Yeah. 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 It's the passionate... The passionate mailroom boy, I, guess. I guess. And then it's 1959. Uh, midnight has struck. Norville owns the company. Sid tries to jump out the window, but instead he goes to the sanitarium with a cigar in his mouth. Yeah, Norville develops a new invention, you know, for kids, which is a circle, again, on a folded sheet of paper uh, that turns out to be a frisbee. Frisbee, yeah. And then the last line of the movie is Moses. And that's the story of how Norville Barnes climbed way up to the 44th floor of the Hudsucker building and fell all the way down, but didn't quite squish himself. You know, they say there was a man who jumped from the 45th floor, but that's another story. Yes! Yes. And on a bad pun, of course. Yes! Yes! All right, that takes us directly... Not including the mezzanine. ...into pedagogy. Yeah, so this one's also got a lot. This is just going to be our longest episode, that's fine. So the first thing I want to ask about this pedagogically, we're going to talk a lot about their nihilism as filmmakers. Is this the only non-nihilistic Cohen film? I mean, there's definitely nihilistic hints, but because it is on the rails of this Hollywood, as you mentioned, Capra-esque kind of storytelling, uh, its ending is very positive. Uh, There are other movies that people get their just deserves, but this movie... uh, emphatically makes it so that everyone who's good gets or who changes to be good. Norville flirts with evil and becomes good. Amy's lost her way and becomes good, you know, like, and Sid's constant evil, you know, like, so everyone who's become good by the end of the film gets good things. And everyone who's been evil gets evil. And I think it's equally notable. This is the only movie that, has a literal spoken description of that concept. Right. I'd On the gazelle scene, yes. they disc- he says, you know, they have a concept for it in India, karma, karma. and she says it's karma. karma. Um, that's it. That. A great wheel that gives us all what we deserve, which I don't think the Coens believe exists, yeah. but I think they included it as if to say, this is the movie we're going to pretend that we believe that and make the movie from that blueprint. Yeah. Which is amazing because the huge circular theme and the blueprint. There's so many circles. And if you study story structure, it's often uh, the diagram you often see is a pyramid, but you also often see the story circle. So I just, I don't know if this is intentional, but I love the idea that they're saying the hula hoop and the frisbee are circles. Here we are. We're going to give you this thing that's, you know, for kids. It's simple. It's fun. It's not how real life works, but we're going to pretend it is well, for the duration of this movie. I mean, like, if I had to say one, like, symbolic 
you know, compositional or like visual strategy that they had in this movie. Uh, circles are good, and points like angles are bad, S- because and they're at uh, they're diametrically opposed because every pronounced like circle in the thing, like a thing that like is an insert mm-hmm. of something or has a shot or comes up again. Look at the things that are circles in this movie. We're talking. Uh, you know, like it's not just the hula hoop and the frisbee and the straw. flexi straw, but it's also the coffee mug stain that makes him right. aware of Hudsucker the position. Uh, the fact that it there's a lot of clocks and watches mm-hmm. in like people who look and pay attention to time are people who are doing something that is good. People who have the back to time, most notably in Sid's office, his back is always to time. And the clock's cut in half. Yeah. Uh, there's one line at the very beginning of the movie in Moses' monologue that he has this just great little turn. Like, it's not even a turn of phrase, but he, he says, out of hope, out of rope, out of time. Mm-hmm. And right as he says that, uh, we can now make out the like what the motto of Hudsucker is because it's right under the clock and it says the future is now. Which is another way of saying like karma. Be- and it's another way of discussing mindfulness. Because I think when Waring talks about the future is now at the end, it does have this, you're like, that felt at first like just attacked on, you know, any business. Like Cyberdyne informational systems, the future is now. But when he says despair looks only to the past and the mm-hmm. future is now. It's you're also like, talking about time freezing <coughs> and like the, like, but you're like, Oh, that actually meant something to him. That was mm-hmm. about being present and looking to the future. Yeah. It's got this cyclical, cyclical nature. And I guess I, I kind of misspoke. I don't mean to say that circles are good. That's it's not as rudimentary as that because the, they also have the commentary, which I mentioned earlier about how there is a bit of a nihilist bent on it, which is entirely in the Hudsucker aspect or just the city aspect itself which is that it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that leads ultimately nowhere. Like the time on a clock, the hands go in circles. and once The rat race aspect. Once it yeah. repeats and it's a new day, it doesn't really matter. Nothing has happened. Time has just passed. And so it's this kind of commentary on the cyclic nature of power consuming, mm-hmm. of like people who want to get more power and how it's a, like it signifies nothing ultimately. Right. Uh, so there's standstill of time and there's also like cyclical nature of time. And if you dwell on the wrong things, you're not going to get your deserves. But yeah, if you, and I think the cyclical nature of Hollywood traditional story structure as well. And just because I can't get around that, like describing karma as a great wheel, Mm -hmm. that's obviously trying to tie it into the cyclical thing. So I think it's like, and I think there's also something to the fact that like all the things he invented are Whammo toys, which is a good company. They made the slinky they made this, yeah. frisbee, uh, yeah, f- things like the this hoop. of this nature. Yeah, the hula, yeah. They invented the hula hoop or extruded plastic dingus, as I prefer to call it. Yeah. Now. <laughs> um, I love all his new ideas. EPD. We've got extra sand for the hard of hearing, a larger model for the portly, mm. a motorized version for the spastic or lazy. <laughs> 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 uh, there's also this other thing about the great wheel and karma. Yeah. I love how there's also like, so you got to just take for granted that this wheel times arrow, whatever you want to call it exists or karma exists. And you believe that what well, you do matters in this, in this universe, universe at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that when these two kind of, um, diametrically opposed opinions on things, kind of meet at the head of course it's going to happen at Hudsucker and it's going to happen through Sid uh, because he propels the you know narrative forward in terms of Norville's story uh, so there's this line when he finally invents and he says we should make the it's the one where Norville's hula hooping and he's like I'm for it well yeah. I'm for it you know like at one point when he's doing his dingus speech he says you've outdone yourself, Norville. You've reinvented the wheel. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which he means, like Sid means, you've reinvented the wheel of being an imbecile. You've mm-hmm. really outdone yourself. Perfect. I'm all about it. But like the subtext and like if you were Moses and this deist God who's right. like seeing everything in all time at all at once and could stop time for, you know, uh, it's, he's, talking about how essentially he's reinventing the wheel. He is on a path that will lead him to quote unquote salvation or karma, better karma, you know, like, um, 
because he's reinvented the wheel. He's he's making people. Uh, con- he's connecting them, even though he's keeping them technically away spatially. <laughs> That's what I wonder, though. So, because so much of the movie involves external forces, including secret forces behind the scenes that make sure everything works out the way it's supposed to. What I was watching it through the lens of: Do I actually like Norval? And he is he good? Because he makes almost zero decisions. And here's my evidence against. He comes in a naive guy. Mm-hmm. Money immediately makes him incredibly shitty. Like he has, I know that becoming a celebrity quickly can warp your views, but he immediately becomes a, like an 80s douchebag. Uh-huh. Immediately. Doesn't that kind of suggest he was always kind of a douchebag inside or at the very least empty inside? Well, I think that's a question we all have to grapple with ourselves because there's that question. The question is, is it better? Is someone who is just inherently good better than someone who is evil and works through hard work to become good? Mm. But is it hard work? That's my other question. Well, I don't know. Well, the question you posed is an amazing philosophical question, but in the case of Norville Barnes, well, he's, I'm just saying... He can't control how dumb he is, for example. That's so what I'm saying. it's a lot of hard work to get over that. I guess, but all that he really does is... Invent circles? He invents the hula hoop. That's true. But I mean in terms of the plot we actually see unfold, he immediately goes crazy with power the second he gets any power. Yeah. Turns on all his friends, literally like fires a nice guy for no reason to be more like the cool guys that he to wants be, to be. I'm like. president now. Then when that completely backfires to the point where he's going to be institutionalized, yeah. he just gives up. And this woman who loves him comes and says, "I love you. Won't you keep trying?" And he goes, "No, I'm going to kill myself." Then only when an angel comes from heaven and goes, "Fine, we'll give you the company, all the money." And the girl, and Sydney will go to jail. He's like, I guess I'll live this life. It just seems like he's kind of a, an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a and metaphor true for love second chance. Conquers chances. all in this. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that says anything about what the Coens actually believe about life and philosophy, or if it was an exercise in making this kind of movie, and we shouldn't even read into it to that level. I mean, not that this, I think not the that they're mutually symbolism's all there, but not that they're mutually exclusive. Also, I mean, you can still get. I mean, this is Sullivan's travels. You can still get a great thing from something that is, to the filmmaker, a rote piece of shit. You can also. I always forget that people don't owe me consistency. Like, they could they could one day feel like life does have meaning and make a non nihilist film, and then make a nihilist film because they feel nihilist the next day. Yeah. That, that's fine. They're that's allowed the to do that. Chris but, Onstad quote, like, some days I just wake up and I think that chicken penises are the funniest thing yeah. that I've ever thought of. But don't you want, I crave, like, for my creators I love the most to have, like, a, a unified code of philosophy that's always consistent. Yeah. So I can be like, that's what the Coens think. That's what Vonnegut thinks. Because you want to put. But they're human. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're just putting little mail into its slots, my man. <laughs> Clop it, Junior. And here's the thing. The world's going to throw you some Max Junior's. It's going to throw you some tiny, tiny little slots that it won't fit in. <laughs> no. Do you uh, think there's a... I also think it's worth noting... By the way, if you like the look and feel of Hudsuckers, see Playtime by Jacques Tati. Oh, my God. You, God damn you. What? I was going to reference the blue... I was going to... Dis- no, nah, I don't even we'll need to... Well, explain why. No, no, no. Uh, now you will explain. You'll I was kind of waiting to how I do convinced. that, but it oh, actually... Okay. It, I, I, had, I had problems of which one I should put it, it into. It ties to pedagogy because so it's the same So the blue letter thing. sequence, right? It's, uh, that's from Playtime. What, from Playtime by Jacques Tati, uh, who's a comedian, kind of for American audiences. Imagine him like the French Steve Martin or the French... Um, Steve Martin's good because he also yeah, is he, somewhat avant-garde he was very like popular. Steve Martin used to be. Yeah, it yeah. was very popular, but like we're talking Steve Martin in the era of like the jerk and dirty right. rotten scoundrels kind of stuff. Like he was pretty he was pretty big into it, but he was also the director of the films. Uh, and he's also like a clown. He was like a physical actor and he was yeah. around in the sixties, uh, which kind of was during this time. Also another filmmaker, Chris Marker, another French filmmaker. Uh, he was also working at this time a little earlier and he made a famous film, short film called La Jete that if you've been to film school, you've studied, it's fine. 12 Monkeys is based on it. Uh, there's two movies that the blue letter sequence takes from. And I, I think that it's important. Uh, one is that Chris Marker is the guy, anytime you've ever seen like, so Chris Marker made this, uh, film about, he made like a 
corporate film, like a film that was just for like the the National Library of France. And they're like, just make us a like a thing that we can play in the lobby, make us a film. And so he made like a like a twenty minute film that like is avant garde and like fucking great. And it's the thing that invented like. So what it does is it takes a book. It's like it's explaining to you what happens to a book when you return a book and how does it get back on the shelf. So it follows this woman and it's like mounts yeah. the camera on like the, the, the cart on the cart and it brings it down and they put it through the tubes and they you know they put like it's ID and it looks kind of like a Hudsucker proxy montage. and it looks exactly yeah. like that. In fact, they have pneumatic tubes yeah. all around that. So that's like just the look of how they filmed the blue letter. Also, like the guy who's walking. You, do, you don't really focus on his face. You focus on his hand the letter, and the blue yeah. letter. So it's just this, like, here's the story about how this letter happens. But it's also kind of a reference to, I think, Playtime, because I, the only reason is because they're both films that deal with modernity and the idea of, like, rebuilding from nothing. And, like, so the physical shapes of the buildings are very similar. Uh, and in France, they had to, like, rebuild Paris. Uh, and there's a sequence where... It, he doesn't, Jacques Tati does not know, and his character, I think, is Monsieur Hello, uh, which is a pun on hello, I guess. Um, and what it is, is he comes in and he's being like, everyone's like, you got to do this, you got to do this. It's basically the sequence that we just saw in Hudsucker, where he's trying to explain to him, and they'll dock you, and they'll dock you, and he's just getting all the things thrown at him, including the kitchen sink. So he's running around, and he's, fall he's like, you just got to find a guy with a blue dossier. Follow the guy with a blue dossier, that's the guy you want to talk to. So in Jacques Stati's film, you just play this game of like different, like this Pink Panther kind of thing where it's like, oh, there's a blue dossier. He runs over, gets there, and he can't find him kind of thing. So it's not just that they're both but blue. you, the audience, can see the dossier in the background or yeah. something. Or like he just barely gets up to someone as they put the dossier in a tube. And because it's a wide shot, you can follow the blue dossier, go through the tube to right. a different office. Yeah. And the reason I think that maybe they did it unwittingly, I just don't think so. They'll never say it in a because the Coen brothers are they're okay. known to being very cryptic in interviews. Um, but I think they chose these very particularly, like the, the look and feel of them, because they're all three of these films are films about like kind of the surrealism of modernism, meaning uh, like for someone who grew up for 20 years of their lives and then went through a war and now has to go back into the workspace mm -hmm. with these new fresh things, like all of traditionalism, oh, like not overnight, but like in a matter of a decade has been completely outrooted. Everything has been bombed and you don't have anything of the old world that you can attach yourself to. Norville is the old world. He is Muncie. He's a Hoosier from Indiana. You know, uh, he's this guy who's this represented by small town America, who's going to try to make it big in the big city. The big city is the one that it's like this modern, like modernity or this, like uh, this landscape that essentially is trying to say, you got to do things this way. This is how we do it now. And he's like, what was wrong with the other thing though? The other thing wasn't broken. So but that's I would why he's I like that. I think that's, I think he is. He like doesn't that. have any, he doesn't, he wants to succeed within the system. He doesn't come in trying to change the system ever. No, I'm not, he's not he doesn't need to change in changing it. the system. I never said anyone was trying to change it. You're just, well, you said, you look at it and it makes you sad and you're like, I wish it wasn't. I don't this think way. it makes him sad. He's happy and excited to be there and he wants to work in the mailroom. He's excited to work. So you think up. when he, you think that when he's drinking, he's only drinking because he doesn't have the president position anymore, or it's that he realizes that he'll never win. No, I think it's because Amy Archer betrayed him and he was in love with her. I, I think that's. I think he's personal. grouping them all together yeah, and saying sure. like, a "All these ta fast talking city types will never. I can't play their game as good as they can, so I'll, I'll just never win." I think is a vastly different thing than saying, uh, "But I was on top and I deserve to be on top, and I'm always going to be on top." No, just the idea. The way you phrased it, I guess, is just what I disagree with. You're that he came to town and he went, but what's wrong with the old way? I don't think he is broadcasting that to anyone. He's not He's broadcasting not saying, it. We should be more like they are in Muncie. We should start a farm here. Right. <laughs> but I guess it's just the films that they're quoting all the time in this are yeah. films that did that. But you're they right. Are. They didn't take that part of those films. So I think there's Howard Hawks in there for sure. There's definitely Howard Hawks. Who else? A, maybe Marx Brothers. More Harold Lloyd, though. You're right. I'd say Preston Sturgis. Sturgis for sure, yeah. 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 
And you guys just got to see it for the visual, like the color palette, the red and the cream that everything is. It's just fucking amazing. They did, they did it's so, a visual treat. They, uh, which even critics at the time, everyone said it was empty and boring, but looked amazing. And I think it's great and engaging and funny and looks amazing. Um, but at least everyone agreed it looked amazing, even at the time. <laughs> what do you think of, well, there's two more things I sure. want to talk about before we get to how do you do that. What do you think about uh, like fate and wind in this movie? And like wind blows the contract out of the window. Wind makes him get the mailroom job. Yeah. Wind makes, I guess, or just like fate. I mean, none of these are necessarily need to be wind, but just some, you know, providence comes in and moves. To me, it just seems like tripling down on this is not a nihilistic universe. This is a well-made universe. Things have to go a certain way. Right. Which if you don't know the term, like a well-made play is a play where the underlying concept is, it follows these rules that are traditional for hundreds of years. If the guy's a dick by the end, this will, he'll walk off stage with a gun and you'll hear a gunshot. Is it the only Coen brothers movie? And I know that we talked about raising Arizona where it's, that involves any, like, not reference to, but any, like, filmic uh, play on the afterlife? Unless you believe that Charlie is transporting us to hell at the end of Barton Fink when the hallway is Then there's is an afterlife, yeah. It's at least building on it. And I think Serious Man is very much concerned with the afterlife, even though you never but see it. But you never it. see it one way or the other. It's you never a see cold it. universe. I mean, it's a different episode, but... Some argue that his dream where he shoots his brother in the back in the rowboat is his brother in the afterlife, like a glimpse of his brother in the afterlife. Uh, I just thought it was a phantom, but we'll talk about that. The Mentaculous? That's for another day. Uh, Um, I think it's the only time we actually see an angel. And this movie, it just reeks of, which is so interesting for the Coens, it reeks of predestination. Everything's a circle. It's meant to be, like you said, you, (coughs) you didn't even really break down the points part. But I know what you mean. The Hudsucker boardroom table is a point pointing at the evil guy. Yeah. The uh, the clock arm is a point pointing at Sid all the time. Yeah. Um, wind causes everything to happen. An angel comes from the sky and saves the The hula day. hoop would not exist weren't for random rolling on yeah. the streets. Perhaps wind as well. You did make me realize that I guess you could very easily Breaking Bad this, which you could do to a lot of stories where you're like, the last 10 minutes is the thoughts that he had as he fell to his death. But I really don't think they want you to think no, of it that I way. And why would yeah. it be that? Well, yeah, it's yeah. a nice little cute thing. No, it, it's supposed to be, yeah, magic saved everything. Because yeah. aren't we happy? I don't Second know. Second chances exist. If magic existed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, you can turn back time. Uh, so I yeah. love that halos are hula hoops. Yeah. Everyone's wearing them upstairs. It's and a fad. They're just spinning around. <laughs> yeah. It's just, just that the halo wobbles a little uh, bit. That's so good. Uh, the other thing. Well, the other question, yeah. Uh, let me look at it. Or observatione. <laughs> I was wondering if the constant use of classical music, specifically from the classical era, not the romantical era, or romantic, I forget what it, how you say it, was maybe another nod to like when everything was well ordered and media was very refined and it always ended the way you expected, you know? Because even though it doesn't draw as much attention to itself because we've often used classical to score our films, this movie is almost to classical music what Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is to bluegrass or folk or country. There is a very robust, uh, mostly Kachaturian, <laughs> uh, Rolodex of great classical pieces in this throughout and some yeah. of them drive really drive the montages home mm-hmm. oh uh, i know what yeah i wanted to talk about is because you mentioned earlier in the podcast you said like i don't really know what it means the dance dream sequence mm-hmm. when uh, yeah and to, unless it's another excuse to play classical music yeah <laughs> it is that i also think that it's like uh it's it definitely starts this because they do it a lot. They, uh, Coen Brothers over their career have done a lot of these kind of surrealist kind of dream montages. I'm looking at you, Big Lebowski. Mm-hmm. You know, um, to me, oh, what this is, one. is I think it's supposed to be an interpretive dance of uh, he's a gazelle or an ipex and she's uh, like, I'm. I think they wanted to get a real ballerina in there. It's and not maybe, Jennifer Jason it's Lee. It's not though, Jennifer right. Jason Lee. So that's 
Like, I think that would have been clear if they did. They definitely use someone who looks like her. That's what's confusing. Is you're like, is this someone who's supposed to stand in for Jennifer Jason Leigh? I think if the Coen brothers had their way, it would be a performer who's so good, just like Jennifer Jason Leigh, who could also do amazing ballet. ballet yeah. And like, how often is that going to come around? Right. Not everyone is immensely talented, even <laughs> the immensely talented. Uh, they can't do that with everything. So I think that's what it's supposed to be, is that he is chasing... Because uh, Amy. He, he's chasing He's chasing Amy. Amy. <laughs> uh, he's trying... Because... Look back at that, uh, the balcony scene, right? The balcony scene, he's like, he's in between two thoughts when he, like, he says, like, karmically, if, if you're, uh, you're a gazelle and I'm an antelope, then maybe we had a bunch of fun with each other and had, like, adventures and we're with each other for a time, picking, you know, like, grubs and birds off of each other's coats. And he has this beautiful, like, you know, speech about what they could be. Or maybe we just had a chance encounter, touched our hooves and passed. Like, so that's the two kind of diametrically opposed kind of interactions that are on top of the circle thing that's happening with his personal and professional career you got this personal career or not career but this romance about like are we just i feel like your soul and my soul are lined up but i don't know if you feel that way too so he's like dancing like a buffoon because he is one and she's this graceful thing in that she's manipulating him and able to dodge the con like i don't know she's way more agile think that in the that's, conversation. he's aware of that remember this is his dream no he's not but, but I'm he saying, could I be do think subtextually maybe in that scene it's just interesting that she's so much more agile than him at conversation yeah exactly that's that's true and i think so now he has to come to terms with as he dreams of basically her um is this something that can happen or is this another thing that I am not well attuned for? Right. Cause also in the scene, his dance is funny and her dance is yeah, he good like, ballet dance. Yeah, he like passes through frame real looking quick. Stupid looking stupid in his socks and shit. Yeah. yeah. Should we get to how do you do that? Yeah. I'm We're fine. already longer than the movie. That's this fine. is the first time we've gone longer than the movie. I, I knew it happened eventually. Oh, well, we both said we really like this oh. movie. So. Um, so I'll start with a question at con. This movie lost to Pulp Fiction. Do you think that's as it should be, or would you go back and change that decision? I think it kicks Pulp Fiction's ass. Really? Pulp Fiction does some fun things with structure that remain I think 94 cool. was a different time where it sure. did something that's fresher. Mm -hmm. So that's usually uh, what wins at festivals. Because, like... When The Matrix came out, like all the CG people were like, well, fuck, now we have to change the game. There's been better CG films than The Matrix, but that shit still holds up, and it yeah. was like the first time that we realized it could be viable. This is a better movie than Pulp Fiction, in my opinion. Pulp Fiction just did something that had never been done before. This is just a wonderfully wrapped up package that had... Yeah. Which has also never truly been done for in this way, but we've seen good movies before. Pulp Siskel Fiction combine ensemble piece with time disjointedness, and you're like, I haven't seen both those things at once. Siskel yeah. and Ebert gave this best film of the year, though. Oh, really? I thought yeah. Ebert was down on it initially. They, uh, okay. they, uh, but when they came out of the, uh, when they came out of the theater, they were like, "This is why movies are made. nice," and they did that with Fargo as well. Uh, I mentioned that the Whammo Company made the hula hoop and the frisbee in real life. They also started the hacky sack, the boogie board, the slip and slide and bouncy balls. <laughs> it's not how do you do that? <laughs> That's a good pedigree for a toy company though. That is it? a good one. Uh, bouncy balls. They're the original bouncy ball. There's a fun, there's a few little random tidbits that I thought were interesting. Uh, so speaking it kind of, I was talking about the blue letter before when that guy comes in through with the, Blue, Blue letter. letter. I don't know whether they made the door or they cast a guy of a certain height, but he's perfectly framed, and it is a very small door. Oh, like he like, almost bumps his head, but he doesn't? I mean, it's perfectly framed for where he holds it up. Yeah. Like, he, he's silhouetted in his initial shot, mm -hmm. and you can tell that he is very... Like, if everyone else in... Who, or they just hired very tall extras, and I think Tim Robbins is pretty tall. Tim Robbins is quite tall. Yeah, so maybe they just hired a normal-sized person. But like everyone else in 
the entire mailroom scene would have problems fitting through that door. So that door only exists for one man for when blue letters happen. Mm -hmm. And also, who is this man? Is he only waiting for blue letters? And then he yells blue letter. Yeah. Blue letters. Mass burger. Uh, so I just thought that that was a cool little like production thing, like yeah. attention to detail that you never notice in movies. They had to either have many casting sessions and, you know, you get, you get a cast, you get a, like a, you know, they tell you what their height is. You meet the, the people when you're doing casting, but like to make everything perfect, they had to figure it out. So yeah. the production designer made that work. I just thought that that was uh things. Also, it's a nod to uh, just more things that fit in holes <laughs> as okay. far as HUD suckers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like it's a mail room. Every, the, everything's perfectly supposed to be running where it is. Um, they made several tables for the boardroom table. They oh. had like six or seven wow, tables. they really look identical. Yeah. They were all Why do they need that? Uh, Why do you need more than one? They needed it for one to like run on. Yeah. One that had the center cut out so that the camera could fit on oh, it. Oh, nice. Uh, they had one that was longer, had, had like a camera mount, but had a longer... Like so, when it so it would look expressionist. Yeah, yeah, and it would also. They also had a table that uh, had vanishing point included. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe it better than that. Like instead of a perfect rectangle like normal tables, one of the sides is wider than the other creates side. Creates kind of an optical illusion. So it creates an optical illusion. They that's the one they use for example when uh, Hudsuckers looking to jump yeah it looks like this kind of weird effect where it's like you must go to that window right it's because they slightly gave it an angle so that nice. it, it's your eyes are focused on that window so they did like different shapes and sizes uh, and they also had short tables just because the they couldn't fit it all in the same room so they shot like depending on what table they were using they shot it out of sequence sometimes when they're just shooting like the sequence where Sid is telling him, once you're dead, you stay dead. Yeah. Uh, they didn't need a huge long table for that, so they could build a smaller set and shoot around it. But for the longer ones, they had to like build out the set to fit for this table. All shot in soundstage, by the way. If yeah. It's not clear. You can tell by the lighting outside, I think, intentionally. So. Yeah, it's all white, like bright. Scrims, yeah. Uh, the skyline shots were all done with miniatures. Yeah, I could tell. Yeah. The opening shot is a miniature. Yeah, every skyline shot, like it unle yeah. like yeah. Except for like looking up at the building when you're on the street. Right, the Hudsucker building's uh, real. Yeah, all the exteriors are exteriors, like when they're walking on the streets and stuff, but all like the bars, every room in Hudsucker, that's all on sound stages, which cuts down cost. But then to show like the skyline and anytime we see the clock where it says like the future is now and it's shot from outside the building, that's a miniature. And obviously for when, at the very end, when he's on the uh, building's edge, and then he falls and all that stuff, that's a combination of yeah. miniature, green screen. A giant fan. A giant fan. Yeah. <laughs> Wires, maybe. Um, I'll take the casting weirdnesses this time. The set of alternate actors that was considered was Tom Cruise as Norville, and Clint Eastwood as Sidney Musburger. Clint Eastwood <laughs> be, would be better Sid than Tom Cruise would be. Than Tom be. Cruise would be a Norville. Although it is funny because the two things Tom Cruise can play <coughs> is charming, likable, and do, huge douchebag. Right. But for some but, reason, I still just wouldn't want him in this. He's too no, modern. He, like, I can never see him being from the 50s. I think he's just too cool for school. Yeah. Like he's he's a Top Gun. He's he's a Top Gun. Like he's charming, but he's charming in a way that like he's looking around. And he's like, you know, you all know you want to fuck me, right? Right. Tim Robbins is like, I just may I get in the room, please, and say hello. And Even though he's like shake six foot hand. eleven, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. His, <laughs> I mean, people don't look like their personalities no. necessarily. In fact, <laughs> often not. But. He just has that look. He's just a, yeah. lot, a lot more... He also just looks more like a... Bumpkin? Yeah. Yeah. Hick? Kind rube. Of. A rube. A real That's all jerk. I got. How about you? I thought there was another one. Casting thing? Uh, yeah. Wasn't there another Norval that was like interesting? Not that I know of. Not that I found in my research. I thought I found one on IMDb, but I didn't write it down because I knew you would... Nope. Uh, no, I don't think I have anything. All right, that's it for how to do that. Do that. 
How do you do that? The last in our three spectra. The short one. Yeah. So uh, bundle, we'll bundle up the episode, and you make sure to bundle up, because baby, <laughs> it's getting cold outside. We're taking you to Fargo, North Dakota. <gasps> Burr. Burr, next episode. Siberia with family restaurants. Where the thing to fear the most is that it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen Fargo. This will be good. You've never seen no, Fargo? I'm kidding. Are you, uh, you just gave me a heart attack. <laughs> I was like, there's no way you haven't seen that. So get hooping. Get hoop. Get hoop. Get into the swing of things. Good. <laughs> This has been a Small Beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the Small Beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!